it is starting to record. Thanks. And has everyone in the waiting room been let in? Yes, correct. Okay. So I'll call to order the TAB board meeting for December 12th, 2022, and start with some ground rules by our technical host, Val, uh, Veronica. Can I pause you for just a moment? I just got a text message from Ryan saying he's in the lobby. I don't know if he means the virtual waiting room or the actual physical lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is he in now? Yeah. Yes. Great, right, perfect. All right, I wanna share screens. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Perfect. All right, we are pleased to have you guys all join us today. I'm gonna to start with a few technical rules. This meeting has been called upon to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking is limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself. Uh, no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak. Please use the raise hand function to be able to, re to, to be recognized for public comment. If you are on the phone, you will need to press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules uh, by muting anyone who violates any rules. The question and answer function is enabled. It is used for individuals to communicate with myself. It should be used for technical or online platform questions only. If an, atten if an attendee attempts to use the chat for any other reason, uh, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during the meeting. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, our next item is the approval of the minutes from our November meeting. Do any board members have any suggested edits to that? If there are none, I'll entertain a motion to approve them as is. I move to approve. I'll second that. All those in favor? Passes unanimously with five votes. Next up, our third agenda item is public comments. If you would like to speak to the board about a transportation matter, uh, please use the raise hand tool within Zoom uh, and you'll have up to three minutes to speak. If you're here tonight to speak about the Vision Zero Innovation Program, we're gonna have a public hearing about that momentarily. So please uh, hold those comments until agenda item four, which is the, the VZIP conversation. So if you're interested in public comment, feel free to raise your hand now. Okay, it looks like we have Tim Crook. Um, he has contact us, contacted the city prior to this meeting, um, asking if he could have five minutes. I wanna have you unmute yourself and identify the two other participants who will be giving up their time for you to be able to speak for five minutes. And uh, is this for VZIP or just a, a general comment? I believe it was a general comment. Okay. So Tim, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Tim, it looks like you're unmuted, if you can speak. Are you talking to me, Tim Crook? Yes, Tim. Oh, good. Sorry. Hi, Devin. 
Okay, I think I'm going to be able to be very brief because I got a very nice phone call from staff this morning stating that there'd been some reconsideration about the chicane on the east end of Quince and they're going to take it down. And uh, can you... I'm sorry to interrupt, Tim. Could you uh, identify the two other people that are giving up their time first if you are going to do the full five minutes? If not, I'll just set it to three minutes. Just That's to fine. I, I can. Can you still hear me? Yes. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't use Zoom very often. So should I just start over now? Uh, you can if you just want the three minutes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just three minutes. It's just little old me here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let Thank you see. so very much for having thought more deeply about the chicane on the east end of Quince. The information I got was that it's going to be taken down and they're going to try pinch points to be determined where they will be at. And also what was stated to me was that speed humps are not um, are still up for consideration at some point in time. So thank you very much. I think that talking about the dangers of what happens after a snowstorm and all of that and pictures that were sent your way were very helpful. And I very much appreciate your consideration. And there's a, a bunch of other people that live on the street that I would think would agree with me. and. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to make some general comments about the ballers in that, um, well, first off, I think finally it, it dawned on somebody that this street does not have sidewalks. And maybe it wasn't such a good idea to use a chicane on a street that doesn't have sidewalks. The second thing about Quince is that we do not have street lights. There are no street lights from 19th to 15th. So at night, especially when the ballards have started to become discolored like they are now, they're very hard to see. I live at 1755 Quince, by the way. So I came down the street the other night and there wasn't a moon and you know it was really hard to see um, where, the, where the delineations were. So I just wanted to point that out for future reference. The other thing that I would say is that in the morning when the sun is rising in the east and in the evening when the sun is setting in the west you are blind going down this street so um and i'm not exaggerating you know i lived here for 30 years i, I feel like i have a pretty good sense of what it's like to drive down this street so um that's kind of huge when you have a lot of signs and a lot of don't go here, don't go there, narrow down to this point, yield to another driver. Um, just food for thought for y'all. And uh, I do have a question about <clears throat> the speed limit in Boulder and residential areas. Has it been lowered to 20 everywhere? Oh, only, tw only 24 seconds left? Uh-oh. I just wanna say one thing. In the 2.7 miles from McGuckins to my house, the speed limit changes seven times. So that can be pretty confusing to people. That's a really quick three minutes there. I guess I'm done. Thanks a lot for taking the chicane down. Very dangerous, but it is not gonna be there. Thanks for joining us tonight, Tim. Any other members of the public that wish to speak during public comment, please raise your hand now. I'm not seeing any, so we'll move on to our public hearing for tonight, which is about the Vision Zero Innovation Program. This will be another opportunity for members of the public to speak if interested, but first we're gonna to listen to a, a staff presentation, then members of the board will have an opportunity to ask clarifying questions, and then we'll open it up for a public comment before the tab deliberation. I think this one's Devin. Welcome, Devin. Thank you, Alex. Good 
Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Devin Joslin. I'm the principal traffic engineer for the city of Boulder, and I served as project manager for the Vision Zero Innovation Program and the subsequent evaluation uh, that I'll be presenting to you tonight. Um, following this presentation, we are asking for TAB to consider a motion to uh, support the proposed recommendations that are presented uh, within this presentation and that you've also seen uh, within the memo that was shared in, adv in advance of this meeting. I'm gonna cover five main things today. I'll give a brief refresher on the Vision Zero Innovation, uh, how it came to be and what the purpose of it was envisioned to be. I'll go over some of the evaluation methodology that we use to evaluate uh, the projects and highlight some of the key findings. I'll summarize the community engagement that we heard, uh, what we heard from folks early on in the process, as well as uh, this latest round of engagement specifically focused on getting feedback on the proposed project recommendations. I'll cover the proposed project recommendations as well as next steps for uh, continuing this program. So if you recall, uh, the Vision Zero Innovation Program um, came to be from a one-time funding allocation from City Council to the Transportation and Mobility Department. Um, and the thought was that uh, the city could try out some new innovative uh, quick build projects uh, with the goal of increasing comfort and reducing risk for pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as slowing vehicle speeds. The main purpose of the program was to understand the effectiveness of these low cost solutions um, in kind of in three ways by collecting community feedback, uh, before and after traffic data, and then analyzing the results and outcomes of that to ultimately build a toolbox from the lessons learned. I wanna point out here that the program uh, was envisioned to focus on horizontal speed deflection treatments, including things like chicanes, curb extensions, hardened center lines, median islands, pinch points, and traffic circles. This was done since temporary vertical treatments like speed humps or speed cushions are not compatible with snow removal during winter storms. And when I refer to uh, quick build improvements, um, we're talking material types like traffic paint, plastic delineator, delineators, concrete wheel stops, and the rubberized curb, uh, such as was used to form the hardened center line at Baseline and Mohawk, as well as other regulatory and warning signs to convey information to motorists traveling through the projects. <clears throat> this slide contains a timeline of the VZIP program from its start uh, on to uh, the next steps proposed in spring of 2023. You can see that along the way, um, there was pretty extensive community involvement as well as tab updates. Um, I wanna point out that the projects that were evaluated um, were installed either in um, kind of late 2020 in the fall or the fall, uh, summer, fall of 2021. So the projects have been out, uh, you know, over a year or a year and a half in some cases um, prior to them being evaluated. In terms of the installed projects, uh, we're very pleased to report that the Vision Zero Innovation Program delivered projects at 20 spot locations and along five residential street corridors in approximately 14 months. The projects consisted of one of three main types, curb extensions, crossing treatments, or traffic calming through those horizontal uh, deflection types that I mentioned earlier. I wanna point out that the cost of all projects was approximately $250,000, and that was inclusive of community engagement materials, design, construction, ongoing maintenance and monitoring evaluation of the project sites. Uh, we installed art in conjunction with eight projects, including uh, examples uh, such as 26th and Spruce, 19th and Yarmouth, and along Grove Street. <clears throat> the average cost per project ranged from about $1,000 to $1,500. Uh, if you compare this to more permanent capital projects, those often cost in the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars or more. 
This slide gives some pictures of representative projects. Uh, you'll see on the left an example of a curb extension. This particular one is the one that was installed at Grove and 17th Street. And this picture was taken prior to the art being installed. In the middle, you'll see a, an example of a crossing treatment. Uh, this is the 10th Street and University Avenue Median Refuge Island that we installed. And in conjunction with this project, we also installed a signed and marked crosswalk. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see two examples of traffic calming. On the top is the Aurora Avenue and 35th Street traffic circle that was formed with concrete wheel stops and included uh, curb extensions using the traffic paint and plastic delineator posts. Uh, at the bottom, it's a bit hard to see, uh, but you'll see an example of a pinch point along Quince Avenue. And you'll note uh, the yield to oncoming traffic, uh, meaning we had traffic uh, alternating through it, taking turns in a one lane uh, configuration. As far as the evaluation methodology, we used quantitative and qualitative data to evaluate each project's effectiveness at meeting three key goals, reducing vehicle speeds, improving safety and comfort for street users, and the ease of maintenance. The evaluation study uh, took all that data and developed recommendations on whether to keep, modify, or remove projects. Modify in this case means make minor adjustments to things like delineator spacing or signs and markings to convey additional information to road users about how to travel through the projects or to better define where parking is restricted within or near projects. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean to remove the project and install something different in its place. Uh, although as you heard from uh, Mr. Crook, that is the plan uh, and what's proposed to be done on Quince Avenue. Uh, much more detail about this evaluation methodology was contained in the draft report, which was included as an attachment memo. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about that uh, following this presentation. Some of the key findings uh, indicate that quick build treatments uh, in general have several benefits, including their ease of installation, greatly reduced cost, ability to modify designs flexibly and creatively, ability to reduce top end speeds, and ease of removal if not found effective. Some other things to consider uh, with quick build treatments and what we got quite a bit of feedback on was uh, things like their appearance, uh, the reduced life cycle and the maintenance concerns. Uh, in this slide, I'll highlight some of the initial engagement and feedback that we got. Uh, I mentioned that throughout the program's history, uh, we relied on feedback to inform the program and do things like identify potential projects, inform design considerations, and assess user experiences. In the first round of feedback, we got nearly 320 responses uh, to our online feedback form. Um, and you'll see over on the right uh, that we, we also worked very closely with um, the neighborhoods and the NSMP liaisons uh, to develop project designs. Um, the corridors initially that received the highest number of form stack comments uh, were the Quince corridor, Aurora corridor, uh, Glenwood from Folsom to 28th and Glenwood from uh, 29th to 30th, as well as the Mohawk corridor. And I would say um, in general, the what we heard initially uh, remained fairly consistent with what we heard um, relative to the proposed recommendations and the second round of engagement. Um, and in fact, I would say by and large, the number of comments on each of the corridors um, remain fairly consistent as well. Um, Quince Avenue and Glenwood Drive emerged as kind of the two uh, top feedback getters uh, relative to the proposed recommendations. Um, so what did we hear as far as our proposed recommendations and how did we get the word out about them? Um, we told the community about our recommendations through a press release, social media posts, a daily camera interview, and an Inside Boulder News segment. And we also placed yard signs uh, in the field near the project sites themselves. 
And there's an example of one of those yard signs here on this sign. In, in total, that yielded us about 76 form stack responses. Uh, 22 just kind of had general opposition to the program as a whole. Two were showing general support for the program. Uh, nine had general comments that were more on the kind of inquire boulder or customer service request type level. Uh, eight expressed desire for permanent NSMP projects and eight uh, expressed a need for maintenance or other activities to be performed on their street. Uh, and this slide by now, you've probably read some of the comments that we got on Quince, just an example of a comment against the project and an example um, for the project on Quince. This next slide just summarizes those uh, comments specific to um, the visa proposed recommendations along the corridors. Uh, and you can see here that Quince was the top corridor that received the most feed feedback uh, with 19 people disagreeing with the recommendations and seven agreeing. Among those that say that they live on Quince, seven said to remove the projects and four said to keep the projects. Among those that did not indicate they lived on Quince, 11 said to remove the projects and three said to keep the projects. Um, the rest is pretty self-explanatory here. I'll just point out uh, that on Glenwood, all but one or two of the comments were related to the projects that were installed to the west of 28th Street. Uh, we really didn't get that much feedback about the projects installed to the east of 28th Street. In terms of the proposed recommendations, this slide highlights the recommendations for the NSMP uh, related visa projects. And you can see that uh, we are proposing that a few of the projects be removed. I'll point out that for the Aurora Avenue and Evans Drive location, uh, that project is planned to be replaced with a permanent curb extension and we will wait to remove the VZIP curb extension until um, we're ready to install the permanent one. And that permanent one, if you recall, is being installed in conjunction with the CMPI pedestrian crossings project. Uh, Glenwood Drive to the east of 28th Street, the recommendation is to remove the curb extension that was put in at 29th, as well as the pinch points uh, between 29th and 30th. And that was primarily due to their uh, ineffectiveness at reducing speeds, as well as feedback indicating a desire to restore the on-street parking spaces that were taken away. On Mohawk Drive, the recommendation is to remove the treatments on the entire segment between Aurora and Baseline. And again, that was due to um, the before after speed data indicating that speeds did not were not reduced uh, as well as some feedback from cyclists indicating that it was now less comfortable uh, to bicycle on Mo Mohawk uh, compared to the before condition. On Palo Parkway, the recommendation is to remove the median that was put in, um, and we do not have plans to install anything else in its place. And you'll note at the bottom, um, the change in the recommendation to the chicane um, we are now proposing uh, a recommendation to modify it, uh, which means we will remove the chicane and explore putting in a pinch point uh, somewhere near where the chicane was located. In terms of the uh, recommendations related to treatments that we said were pedestrian crossing enhancement projects, um, you can see by and large, these are recommended to be kept. Um, with the one exception being the Spine Road and Chaparral curb extensions and Median Island. The modification there will consist of adjusting delineators uh, to provide a wider path for snow plows. We found that many of the posts were damaged during snowy conditions. In terms of next steps, um, we're planning to, after tonight's um, meeting and, and feedback from CAB and the public, we want to finalize the evaluation report and the project recommendations. Then in the spring, we'll look to implement the changes at the VZIP sites for the final recommendations. And then in 2023 and beyond, we really just want to consider the lessons learned from VZIP about where, when, and why uh, we would install similar projects. 
at sites across the city. So with that, we are requesting that TAB support the proposed recommendations resulting from the VZIP evaluation study. And we have some suggested motion language for you to consider in doing so, should you desire to do that. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Devin. Do any board members have any questions, Tila? Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Devin. Um, I, I really liked the, um, the draft report. It had a lot of information that I was wondering about. Um, and I think as a template for sort of evaluating, self-evaluating what we do in the future, it's pretty great. I just, for purposes of our tab motion, want to clarify what has changed, if anything, in the, from the memo to tonight. So it sounds like the modifications on uh, the chicane, I'm super unclear what you're planning to modify, uh, which one on Quince, um, and are there any other differences between what we saw in the memo versus what you're recommending tonight? There is one difference. The memo indicated to keep the chicane and tonight, after further consideration of the public comment, uh, some considerations <clears throat> and review of the, the snow and ice conditions along Quince, we are recommending that the chicane be removed and in its place, a pinch point be installed. And the pinch point would be similar to those that are already installed on Quince uh, between 15th and 17th. Right. So I did note that the memo in describing what a chicane was, or the, the draft report in describing what a chicane was and a pinch point was said there's some, sometimes some repetition and sometimes they're called, the chicane is called a pinch point. So you are essentially moving the chicane that is currently on Quince West of 19th Street somewhere else. And so instead of being an S-shaped thing the drivers go around, it's looking, like you're planning to do a different pinch point where things are narrowing down. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Like narrowing down to one lane kind of. I, I would say so. Other. So the, the primary concern of the chicane was that it was pushing drivers to the edge of the roadway. And what happens with the pinch point is it, it puts people in the middle of the roadway in a one okay. road configuration. Okay. But we're expecting still two treatments on Quince. It's just that the chicane is going to turn into a different kind of treatment somewhere nearby where it is. Correct. The, okay. the final determination of the pinch point location is to be determined. Um, but everything else on Quince is proposed to be kept. OK, great. I will note that the curb extension that was installed at 19th Street and Quince that is planned to also be made permanent in conjunction with the upcoming 19th Street multimodal project next year. Gotcha. Okay. So even though that's actually on Quince, it'll still be part of the 19th Street project. Cor correct. Great. Yeah. Good to hear. Uh, I was really confused at one point about the numbers and the money. Uh, and I guess mm -hmm. I have a bigger question, which is, um, as you noted, this is this was kind of an opportunistic one-time funding opportunity. Um, we were in, on tab pretty excited to see it uh, in general, very encouraged by how, how nimble um, and experimental staff was. So I really wanna commend you on all of that. Uh, but this report is you know, a lot of attention, a lot of, um, I think, good uh, analysis and thinking about what happened. Do we anticipate that the VZIP program has a future? Do we think it's going to be the new NSMP? Do we think at some point we will be asking city council to bless us doing more of it? Or was this really a lot of effort spent on something that's gonna be a one-time thing? That is a very good question. And I, I don't think we have a solid answer that we can provide you. I do think it is something that we'll be talking about as we explore opportunities to potentially reinvent and refresh and reimagine the NSMP. This might be one alternative that is considered as part of that. Um, and I do think they have a certain place in space. I think in general, we found that the 
pedestrian crossing treatment enhancements were fairly non-controversial and I think were pretty well appreciated. Um, so I think it could be that we look to leverage them uh, to enhance pedestrian crossings, but not so much as a traffic calming tool along as a speed as a speed mitigation tool. Correct. Because there's traffic calming and there's speed mitigation, and sometimes there's an unfortunate <laughs> conflation of those ideas as well. Mm. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear what it is we're trying to aim at, and I think the draft report is very good at saying we were trying to reduce speeds. Um, I did note uh, that the NSMP projects tended to be more successful in reducing average vehicle speeds. Um, I thought that some of the treatments, like I, I just love the data and analysis, but that uh, some of the treatments showing that average speeds for the VZIP projects weren't seriously impacted, but there was a really big delta on the highest speeds. In particular, Quince had the biggest one, I think, um, vehicles going between 25 and or above 25 miles an hour, so 30 and above. Um, that really tells me this was an effective thing to tame some of the worst behavior out there and gives us a good basis. Like this report is a really good basis for arguing for continuing a program of this type. And so I just wanted to commend the amount of work that went into it to be able to give us sort of the data-driven decision-making capacities that we've been looking for. Um, that being said, uh, you said at one point that um, the VZIP program was a $250,000 expenditure. Um, we are talking about roughly 20 treatments, right? across town. And this um, looks to me like it means the average cost per thing is twelve and a half thousand dollars, not one thousand to fifteen hundred. Can you explain what the where I'm off here? <laughs> is this a factor of tens yeah, of big there I apologize for that confusion. There were many ways to decide what constitutes a project and how do you commit convey that. Um, what I was trying to say there was there were projects installed at 20 spot locations, so 20 intersections, whatever, unique right. locations, not part of a corridor type project. And then there were the five total SMP corridors that had multiple projects installed on them as a means of um, speed mitigation and traffic. Okay. But those NSMP projects were sometimes three or four different spots. Cor correct. Yes. Okay. So, so from Quince, for example, we gotcha. said there was the curb extension, chicane, another curb extension, and two pinch points. So Quince essentially had five projects installed on one corridor. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I did note one of the takeaways on the draft report was that uh, vertical Diversions seem to be more effective than horizontal ones. These horizontal, these VZIPs are horizontal generally, and that's why they're cheaper and require less stuff. And so I was just trying to figure out sort of the cost of an NSMP project, which was only vertical. It was only speed humps and speed cushions. Um, and those were kind of capped at $10,000 each because that's what a speed hump costs. So I was just trying to kind of try to compare apples to apples because um, as, as we knew, um, the demand for NSMP projects for speed mitigation um, far outstripped our ability to, to provide them. Uh, and the VZIPs, I think, were a really good attempt to try to meet that halfway. And I think it did meet it kind of halfway. So I'm pretty impressed with what we could achieve. I was just trying to make sure that what we were showing as, as, as the cost differentials between those was accurate. Um, so that's something I would look for more clarity sure. on in the final report, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then to answer a question that came up in the chat for Ryan Schenhard, um, the, so traffic mitigation is usually a, oh, the cat, stop, is a, uh, I have a kitten here, sorry, um, a way to reduce traffic volumes and congestion and peak period um, sort of headaches from traffic. And then speed mitigation, of course, is to reduce the high speed um, or worrisome speeds of, of motor vehicles. And treatments are different for those and strategies are different for those in the city. It historically has, has treated them differently. So that was just a little background for, for Ryan when I, when I had mentioned earlier, there was two different things. Um, Devin, earlier on in your talk, 
you had talked about the vertical speed mitigation measures versus the horizontal ones. And you had said, I, I wrote it down, uh, the vertical speed management is not compatible with snow removal. And I just wanted to back up on that a little bit um, because of course we do have speed humps on places that are plowed. Uh, Edgewood, just, uh, just west of Folsom. Um, Pine at 11th Street, that section gets plowed. I believe 55th Street gets plowed. The, the road um, 55th, just south of baseline going toward the rec center gets plowed and the, we have four or five new speed humps there. So uh, it might make it a little more difficult. And I talked about the little tortoises in the road, certain vertical um, speed management and, and sort of traffic guiding um, elements are incompatible with snow plowing. But in general, the speed humps and the speed cushions that we're seeing are not. I just wanted to clarify, is that your understanding? It, it is, but I'll clarify that what I meant there when I said my statement within the presentation was essentially temporary vertical devices. So a speed cushion or speed hump that is made of a rubberized curb material that would get bolted down to the roadway. Yep. And you can imagine that those bolts could potentially come loose Right, and there's hard edges to those things. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, okay. that's what I meant there. Gotcha. But otherwise, um, you are correct that other, you know, permanent asphalt speed humps and speed cushions are compatible with blocks. Okay, great. I, I I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your uh, like analysis. I really like the draft report. Thank you. Thanks, Tila. Are there any other questions before we? Open up to the public hearing and then our comments. Becky. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I really appreciated how thorough this report was as well. Um, just had a couple questions. Um, one, um, I know a lot of there are a lot of you know um, aspects around this related to maintenance and and how that how design affected that. And I was wondering if those were often features of these being temporary projects. And so they're more likely, like a snowplow is more likely to hit it and, and damage it because they're you know, these flexible features. Um, and if they were made permanent into a more permanent kind of concrete or something that that wouldn't be an issue or was it predominantly more about the, the design or the street context? Uh, just, yeah, wondering about that. It's a good question. I would say maintenance was judged in one of three ways. Um, the first being just the amount of times that crews went out to replace posts that were found to be missing for, for whatever reason. I mean, most likely someone hitting them and knocking them down. I do think we had a few instances of folks purposefully trying to take out posts because they were frustrated with projects. Um, the second way was just from feedback from the crews who clear snow and ice from the roadways. And, uh, you know, hey, it's really tight for me to get through here, or I'm having to pick up my blade in this area, that kind of feedback uh, about the corridors. And then the third way was through conversations with the fire department and their ability to get the fire trucks um, in and out of these project areas easily. Um, all the projects were designed with the ability to do that in mind. Um, which in some cases resulted in there being a little bit wider openings than maybe would have been preferred. Um, but I would say that that was kind of the compromise of the program. And to your earlier point, I would say that uh, if these were made permanent, um, maintenance of them most likely would not be an issue. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking also adding to that, like to what extent there are consistent issues with just like it, with needing to to reduce speeds and then running into conflict with either maintenance or emergency services and if that like is there an area of is are there area does that need to be worked on in the future because it's a consistent barrier or is it more of a something that we have ways to address and have have dealt with and so it's not it's not a barrier to you know eventually you know implementing these kinds of projects uh, more often yeah, I think we have a great partner in the fire department, uh, Dave Lowry, the fire chief, 
Fire Marshal is uh, very willing to have conversations with us and advise on designs. And he's often open to, to trying things like this and, and allowing us to be innovative. Um, so I, we're thankful for that partnership. And then I think on the snow and ice removal side, we're continuing to look at ways to get equipment that would allow us uh, to get into tighter spaces. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I, one other, another question I had was, um, on a couple of the um, projects that are being removed, oh, particularly on, on Mohawk and I guess also on Palo Parkway, I understand that they just didn't show sufficient improvement to merit staying. Do we know why they were ineffective? I don't think we specifically know why. Um, my assumption is that it was because the lanes were just not narrowed enough. Again, because of the need to accommodate plows, the opening was about 13 feet wide. And I think it just didn't uh, constrict vehicles enough to where they felt they needed to slow down. Mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't be would it be too difficult or are there like reasons why we wouldn't narrow it further, like modify it to narrow it further versus taking it out? I think it has to do with the, the snow and ice removal and we were wanting to, to not compromise on our ability to do that. I would say on Mohawk, the additional feedback we got that was a tipping point was the feedback from the cycling community that because there were things both in the middle of the roadway and on the edge of the roadway, it made it difficult for vehicles when looking to pass a cyclist to have the ability to give them room when doing so. And cyclists often felt either rushed from behind or kind of pinched as they were being passed. Okay, thanks. So it sounds like there were enough sort of combined issues that it would take a lot to overcome them. And right, and I, I think done now. in the case of Glenwood, to the east of 28th Street, um, those pinch points really didn't stick out a whole lot more than a, a car parked on the street. I think they stuck out maybe a foot or two more than a parked car. Um, and because of the parking density on that segment of Glenwood, people were pretty used to having kind of that narrowing already. And it, it didn't really add or enhance that much in the case of, of the pinch points that were installed there. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, it's a good segue to my last question, which was, or I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Um, and it's about about Glenwood. And um, I, I mean, it makes sense what you just said about it and what was written in the report about why um, it's slated for removal. Um, um, but I guess my one concern or comment is that um, I'm concerned that if we, in the report, we're stating we're like one of the reasons we're removing this is because people were concerned about parking, is that that might set a precedent that like helps set a precedent where concern about losing a few parking spaces is sort of seen as, you know, on par or more important than the safety benefit the project would have provided. And I understand there are other reasons this one's being taken away, but I guess my suggestion would be that we don't include that as a rationale because because there's definitely going to be projects we're going <laughs> to we'll take away parking in favor of safety and people are going to complain about it and I just want to make sure that like safety is is just always seen as paramount um, in those situations yeah thank you for that that's a very good comment um, but otherwise I, I understand the, the rationale for that particular decision so um, thank you Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Any other questions? Alex, I have a few. Okay, Ryan. Devin, thanks. Um, I have just a few questions um, that I mainly am asking, thinking about work we have ahead with CAN and um, the, and so the process of going through a transition where we're we're installing or we're we're taking down projects. Um, so I, I guess I'm first uh, kind of hungry to know more about the objective reasoning, like reasons we have for removing. And I'm sort of picking up on um, Becky's comment about parking. That, that got my attention when you said parking earlier too. Um, 
I, I'm reading through, I think it's page 23. It's sort of like a list of kind of like some reasons that um, like things didn't work, you know, there were concerns. But I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's like, do you see a taxonomy or some objective or general, generalizable set of reasons that we, that we should know as, as TAB that, or the public, that like th these are the kinds of reasons we would remove um, treatments like these that are meant to whether calm traffic or, or mitigate speed. Um, and not to put you on the spot if the answer is well, not, not, not exactly, but I'm just curious if there's something I'm missing here or to know about, um, you know, the, the reasons, the, the legitimate reasons from the city's perspective um, in an objective sense. I would say, and I, I hope it was clear in the report that really the first level screening or filter that was used to evaluate the projects was their effectiveness at reducing speeds if that was kind of the main reason we were putting them out along the corridor. And that was measured in a few ways, looking at both kind of the 85th percentile speed reduction, as well as, as Tila mentioned, the ability to reduce sort of those top end speeds, those that are five or 10 or, or even more over uh, the posted speed limit. So that was really the first filter. And I would say there were some instances like on Mohawk, um, where they really didn't get through that first screening filter um, because the before and after data on that particular corridor uh, indicated essentially no, no change in speeds. Um, the other thing I would say we, we paid careful attention to as hopefully came through in the comments from Mr. Crook was sort of the feedback from the residents and those who are often walking or biking along the corridor and their perceived level of comfort as they were doing so. And if it was found um, that a project, you know, really put folks in a situation where they were less comfortable than when before the project was installed, um, that was also carefully considered in the recommendations. And then the final element was the, the maintenance component and to what extent we were needing to go out to sites to replace the posts and do maintenance on them, as well as the feedback about how easy it was to, to take care of the snow and ice removal and, and get in there if there was an emergency. The, the, the speed reduction and maintenance to me make a lot of sense as, as objective things you can, you can look at. The, the people's concerns one um, I, makes me wonder, I think there were 76 form, form stack responses. Um, did, I, my sense is that that wouldn't count um, other comments we, you've re we've received over the last, I don't know, year or so. I mean, we've had previous TAB meetings where residents have come in and they've spoken in favor. I, I don't know if they're included in these form stack responses, um, but can you comment in general, like does, to what extent do, do the 76 form stack responses represent the overall feedback we've, got, we've gotten from residents on the, I guess, sort of like the pro or the con side? Um, on, on visa or and if, and if you don't know that's fine too i'm just i'm just curious how much of it is that form stack versus you know there's a wider set that we've heard sure and and i see natalie you've got your hand raised as well if you want to chime yeah. in yeah no no i'll go after you Devin. okay i would say ryan um you are correct that this was um an instance where there were some corridors where there was much more feedback than others uh, the form stack re response rate that I mentioned, that was uh, in the first case, the first round of engagement following the installation of projects, we got about 320 responses from across the community. And then the most recent engagement push um, in which we were asking folks to comment specifically on the proposed recommendations and whether they agreed or disagreed, that's what yielded the 76 responses across the city. Um, I answered your question. I mean, it, it was, you know, there, but there were certainly interactions outside of the form stacks uh, over the course of these projects being installed that staff was responding to feedback and meeting with residents and conducting observations on site. And I, and I was just going to add um, that you know, we we really did, as Devin said, we took 
public comment or feedback from the community who use the treatments, um, whether they're walking and biking along the corridors, you know, before the treatments and then during the treatments, because that was, you know, a critical part of kind of the process for us to determine whether or not they should be modified or, you know, or removed. Um, and, and I think, you know, there might be an opportunity for us to just go back and clarify as we finalize the report that parking the, you know, the lack of parking, I guess, was really just a comment from the, um, that we heard as part of the feedback, but it wasn't, you know, as Devin said, when we were thinking about the criteria, it was really those three main things and parking wasn't a heavy, you know, driver for us to make a decision about removing it. If it was ineffective and also people, you know, felt like they could, they couldn't park, well then, you know, they lucked out because it was ineffective and we were going to remove it anyway. Um, so I just wanted to add that clarity. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, um, I guess I shouldn't take too much more time. I'm, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, uh, I, Becky, what something Becky said about, maybe it was, maybe multiple people said this, but just about, yeah, um, feeling a little, um, anxious about, this, uh, establishing or implying a precedent that um you know these things can go out if, if if motorists coming through decide they don't like them and they can make you know make enough noise and um and i know i'm not nobody's said that, that exact sort of a thing but um i uh i i, I heard the word controversial Devin, and i forgot how, in what context but i was thinking you know you could you could think of controversy here in different ways you could think it controversial in terms of do we we um uh, co community members believe that the safety treatments are not effective, but we know as staff through objective measurement that they are effective. That's one form of a controversy. And that's one in which I think the city in, in this example um, is the authority. I think another kind of a controversy could be people just don't, they just don't want the traffic calming. They just want to motor through. Um, again, a controversy, I don't think that's worth a lot of um, our, you know, fr frankly, attention. Um, so I'm just thinking about this in terms of CAN and this massive set of projects that we have to go forward and how we how we think about this, um, you know, reasons for, for taking things down. My sense is, I, I don't know if I missed this in the report, but like a pretty big reason for taking for, for this is just resources. Like we, I mean, we just have limited ability. Um, just, you know, there's only so much we can do and we have to focus. And I think that's a really good reason to, to say, look, we're just gonna stand down on some of this work. Um, so, sorry, I'm going off into comments now, but I think I, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, thanks, Devin, for and Natalie for entertaining my questions. Um, I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Good, good, good job. Thanks, Ryan. Trini, do you have anything? Well, I guess to me, well, thank you, Devin, and I mean the all the data and everything. So it, it's really helpful and 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 a great job. But I just what I was noticing is. Um, how these projects are highlighting some deficits from, especially from our um, our comment from the public, um, where this person was <laughs> highlighting the fact that they don't have sidewalks and they don't have um, lighting. I mean, I think those are kind of tied in together. And, and the more we explore um, these projects, I think more of these issues are gonna come up. So, I mean, I'm very new at this. So. I, I have a question, especially about the lighting. I mean, would these things be able to be kind of hand in hand with the projects as you guys move into different areas in the future? Or is it something that's taken care of by another department or how does that work? That's a good question. I, I think lighting in general is considered as an element of our capital projects. Mm -hmm. In the case of the, the Quince Avenue corridor, um, that was not really considered as part of the installation of the VZIP projects. Mm -hmm. um, that particular part of North Boulder, as you know, is very rural in character and, and really none of those streets have street lighting along, um, along them. Um, so that was not an element considered to be part of the installation as part of the Vision Zero Innovation Program. But it is a key consideration as we um, install our capital projects. Yeah, and I'll just add, 
Um, so the city of Boulder actually is going to be acquiring the Excel streetlight system um, in the coming couple years. That process will be beginning. And um, as part of that, you know, and I'm sure Mike isn't here with us, but uh, Mike Sweeney is managing that project on the transportation side. Um, and as part of that, we will be kind of assessing, taking a look at the system as a whole to see, you know, are, do we have the light, the right amount of light distribution across the city? Um, you know, that's a very, uh, talk about controversial, I guess, topic um, in the community around lighting. So um, when we get to that, you know, point in that project, we'll certainly be in front of TAB and council as we go down that road to acquire that system. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. With that, we'll open up the public hearing. Any members of the public wishing to speak to TAB on this topic, please use the raise hand tool within Zoom and we'll call on you for up to three minutes of, of public comment. I think, uh, yeah, welcome back, Veronica. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um... Michelle Bishop, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you could let me know if you're able to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right. Thank you. For speaking. Thank you. My name is Michelle Bishop, and I'm uh, one of the board members of the Gosgrove Neighborhood Association. And um, uh, first, I want to thank the uh, City Transportation Department for the decades worth of support that we've had here in this neighborhood with the types of things that we've um, requested to enhance pedestrian and cycling safety in this neighborhood, including the, the counter flow lane on Grove that we asked for and, and uh, was accomplished and the three extra crossings painted on the intersection of 17th and Grove, one of which is the um, bulb outs that we're talking about today. So we've had a long history of cooperation. Uh, we, there's still things to be done, uh, not only speeding, but on all of the streets, including 17th Street, but aggressive driving uh, combined with speeding. But we have, we have three intersections that were part of this project, 17th and, and Grove, 18th and Grove, and one that you left off, Devin, is 20th and Grove. There's a big bulb out there also. They were painted with the uh, paint project. Regrettably, they were paved over six months later. And uh, hopefully we're gonna get the 17th Street intersection repainted pretty soon. So, um, and I think I haven't heard anything specific other than people commenting that it certainly slows a lot of the traffic down and it keeps people stopping at places that they weren't ordinarily stopping at stop signs to get around the bulb outs. So overall, um, I think we're doing well. I do have a question about the, the count that you have, Devin. Which crosswalk was the count that you have on this sign at 17th? Which? Yeah, sorry, Michelle. I'm, I'm trying to pull that information up now. That's all right. I'm finished as, as if I can get that answer is all just curious. Thank you very much. All right, um, Tim Crook, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Let me know if you can unmute yourself. How's that? Perfect, all right. All right I already talked, did everybody hear what I said at the beginning when I didn't know what I was doing there? Is that okay? All right, so I'm just gonna say one thing about the lights. I brought that up about the lights because there aren't lights on this street. I, for one, don't want lights shining in my living room window. The fact that there aren't lights on this street, when you come down this street, it's difficult to see the bollards, especially when they uh, are worn, they're dark and discolored over I don't know how that happens. People are hitting them or they, so the fact that there aren't lights on this street uh, makes it more difficult to see the ballers at night. 
I'm not proposing that you illuminate this street. I like it the way it is. <laughs> it feels very rural. And the other thing, uh, the word was used about walking down the street, the word or what was uncomfortable. That is not a word that I would use when I'm walking east on Quince and um, I'm in the chicane and it's just snowed and a car whips by me within like a foot if i fall it's it's going to be a really bad thing that's not uncomfortable that's dangerous so uncomfortable it would be a kind of a nice way to say it we're, we're not uncomfortable we feel like what was done here was put pedestrians at risk quote unquote so that's a lot different than being uncomfortable. I'm, un I'm, un I'm uncomfortable for a lot of different things that I won't go into. But, you know, I know it, you get, it's been a, a difficult thing with Quince. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that everybody's come out. And I appreciate that you're going to take the chicane down. And, um, again, I understand why you can't put up temporary speed humps because they're bolted down but i think if you did a straw poll of what people really want on this street to slow traffic down it would be speed humps and speed humps um you know you can you can plow this street if they're permanent speed humps so thanks a lot i'm going to sign off now bye bye <laughs> And then our last person is Peter Baldwin. But I'll have you to speak and let me know if you're able to unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I just wanted to add my voice to uh, Michelle's um, comments. Uh, uh, we appreciate the two speed tracker studies conducted by the police showing that only one motorist out of 2,800 was shown to be going 10 to 19 miles over the posted speed limit, and 95% were going at or below the speed limit of 20 miles per hour in the Goss Grove neighborhood on Grove Street. Um, it still means there were a lot of vehicles, over 100, traveling above the speed limit in the course of the week that it was uh, analyzed, which is really uh, still too fast for the Goss Grove neighborhood. And the, the curb extensions at 18th and Grove and 17th and Grove and the third one that Michelle mentioned, 20th and Grove, uh, do help in regulating traffic, but they, they don't slow down traffic that's moving straight, um, in, in my view. And, uh, you know, regardless of what the speed tracker uh, data shows, the... Um, we notice uh, people driving too fast on Grove Street still, and it's not just me, but when I'm out there talking to one of my neighbors, uh, uh, they will raise their eyebrow at, at, uh, at cars going too fast or say something. Um, so it, it's still a problem and, and uh, really um, it only takes one vehicle to do a lot of irrevocable damage. The only other thing I would say, uh, uh, in favor uh, has to do with the 35th and Aurora traffic circle, which does seem to um, slow uh, drivers down. I do walk my son's dog in that neighborhood. Um, there, there is a law of unintended consequences though, and that is that since the traffic circle has been put in place, uh, it seems that drivers don't see the need to stop for pedestrians. They just kind of sail into the crosswalk. So it, just as a suggestion, it may be useful to put in crosswalks or reminders that uh, you're sp still supposed to yield to pedestrians. I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, thank you very much for the work that you do, uh, Devin and, and others, and um, really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. If there, I don't see any other hands, so if no one else is interested in speaking, I'll go ahead and is there a hand now? Oh, Devin. 
we'll go ahead and close the public hearing um, and then open it up for tab deliberation. Devin, did you have something? Thank you, Alex. I don't know if she's still on the line, but um, Michelle had asked what the count was that we had referenced on the yard sign that was placed at 17th Street and Grove. And I, I found that information, Michelle. Essentially what we did was uh, before and after pedestrian crossing count at 17th and Grove. And it indicated that before the curb extension was installed, there were 166 pedestrians crossing in a day. And after we, the day we counted, there were 272 pedestrians crossing that day. Thanks, Devin. I guess if I could hop in for another little small piece of, of, of um, housekeeping because Tim Crook asked what the deal is with the speed limit change. Uh, so assuming he's still on and listening, uh, yes, 20 miles an hour is the default speed limit for everywhere in Boulder unless otherwise sign posted. So on Quince, it's now 20. Thanks for that clarification. Anyone from TAB have any thoughts on the recommendation that staff has provided for us and is asking uh, formal feedback on? I guess I'll jump in, just say the, the report was really informative. I think it's for relatively small things. This is a, an amazing amount of, of data to see how things are going. Um, really supportive of the, the crossing treatments. I think that'll really help us towards some of those mode shift goals that we have in our TMP. Um, the traffic calming, I think we showed it was in places effective. I'm not sure if with Vision Zero, I don't, I'm not sure we're saving a whole lot of lives or preventing severe injuries there. Um, so in general, I'd be more in favor of focusing our Vision Zero efforts on, on the arterials, of course. Um, but I think the, you've, listen to the the community multiple times before these things were installed you've demonstrated a lot of flexibility in modifying these and i think the the recommendations that you've brought forward have been really reactive to the community and, and thoughtful so i'm i'm prepared to support it anyone else from tab want to speak tila Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, well said. I am also prepared to support the staff recommendation uh, and was, as I mentioned earlier, like impressed at the amount of <laughs> effort that went into this. Uh, just to the analysis and sort of the, it, it was like doing the NSMP sort of justification of, of treatments in reverse, saying here's what we learned. Um, and to the extent, um, I, I thought it was a really smart move um, to when the NSMP kind of got canned to say, well, okay, we already have sort of these requests for intervention for speed mitigation. We already have demonstrated um, neighborhood support for some kind of change here. Uh, we're not able to serve these particular streets and neighborhoods um, with the treatments that they asked for, but this is maybe a, a good backup, you know, or, or a way to try to meet them halfway. I thought that was just such a smart thing to do to be able to prioritize and now to have this report and say, well, here's here's where the data is. Um, I think it's going to be super helpful. And so I would encourage Natalie and Devin and you know other staff to the extent that we can make a pitch to city council or the city manager's office for um, bolstering financially and in the budget, these kinds of efforts in the future. Um, I think all of TAB is on board and on record was saying our most serious problems are the arterials and where the speeding is um, the, the biggest contributing factor to discouraging vulnerable road users or injuring them. Um, but to the extent that this is a really great way to say we have other tools in the toolbox to be responsive um, to community requests and perceptions um, that can be backed up with data about unsafe driving conditions. This is a great tool to point to. Um, I remain cautious about over empowerment of the noisiest communities. Um, so I would definitely like to see some kind of um, 
Oh gosh. Um, economic, social status, so, you know, some sort of like, like filter for the likelihood of people being empowered and um, engaged enough with their local community to ask for help versus communities and neighborhoods that might be more or equally impacted by negative driving behaviors and traffic violence indicators that um, are not as empowered and not as able to, to step up. And so the, the racial equity tools um, and the economic equity tools that we can bring to bear um, on a future effort like this, I would definitely like to see have more prominent place. That being said, I, as I said, I'm very impressed with the data and being able to point to the effectiveness of these things and, and just you know, when I was reading the report and wondering, I'm like, I wonder if we have pedestrian counts. There it was two pages later. So really um, want to commend the amount of work and effort that went into analyzing and not just sort of having a, a gut feeling about whether this stuff worked, but really to have something to point to. And I'm hoping it will be a tool to help us be more effective, um, not just in responding to the community, but actually being able to demonstrate the, that we can make changes that make a difference to people's lives. Let's just make sure that we're um, applying it in a more equitable fashion than just people having um, the wherewithal to start a petition under the old SMP. So that being said, even with the modification on Quince, so I, would, I would like to um, support the staff proposal here. Yeah, and I'll just um, add, um, I also su support the proposal. Um, and only reiterate the, my request that that little piece on parking be removed on page 29. But otherwise, I, um, yeah, I, I support um, what's been presented here today. Thanks a lot. Trying to go ahead. I support as well. That's all I want to say. I mean, I think you guys have covered absolutely everything. Um, so. Also, uh, Devin, I support this, um, the recommendation. I, uh, I really have enjoyed, continue to enjoy the program. Um, I think staff's done such a, such a nice job of, of being innovative and making this work and listen to feedback. Um, I appreciate the care and the analysis that's gone into your presentation. Um, and I ride my bike every day with small kids on a lot of these streets. Um, and I, I think they're just fantastic. And I hear some of the comments, um, about people with concerns, and it makes me wonder if they're on a bike or a car, um, and, and if you know some of the opposition we hear is simply opposition to the, the premise that we should be calming streets, slowing cars down. So, um, just th uh, three quick comments, um, just perhaps for the for the record, and echoing some things folks have said. Um, I, Devin, I like the way that you clarified that we have some objective reasons for remove that like we actually have, you know, objective reasons for doing some of these removals or, or modifications. And, um, the, the, and then the clarification that those reasons do not include um, parking, <laughs> uh, similar to Be Be uh, Becky's comment. Um, so yeah, please, if that, if that could be reflected in the, in the memo in the minutes, that would be great. Um, and then also kind of picking up what Tila said on, on the comments we've heard, we, you know, projects like these, we, comments we hear from the public are just, um, sh they're structurally biased towards car users for the simple reason that most people are driving cars. And they also structurally undercount the, the residents of the city that are using the, the particular corridor as part of a wider network um, because they would just naturally draw more attention to folks who live near them. So um, one thing I would love, I would have, in the future, I'd love to see in, in, in comments, uh, analysis of comments is um, if there's a way to see the, the, the use, the, the mode being used by the commenter. I know that's complicated because people are, you know, may use more than one mode, but um, gosh, that would be interesting if we, to see, we see the number of counts that are in opposition and then in support, if you sort of break those down and if you see, well, the, the opposition tends to be a car driver and the others tend to be outside of a car. Um, that's that, that, I think that that's interesting. Um, and then I guess related, just like the, the, a staff view on the importance of the corridor to the wider network and the TMP. I mean, that's, that's, that's what this is all about um, in, in, in many ways. So, um, so anyway, I'm just, just, just thoughts for the future. 
Um, and then my, the final comment is um, just big picture. I, I think this is uh, wasn't really explicit in the presentation, but I, I staff's doing such a great job here with with limited resources. And I think this is just another one to add to the list of exhibits for reasons that we need to figure out how to get more resources to fund all of the transportation projects we need. Um, I don't know if that's a ballot measure, if that's what that is, but um, I hope that we can continue to work together to 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 not to to avoid just just conceding that we are working with limited resources and do our job. I guess now I'm talking to tab to tab in bringing this to council as a political values based uh, decision that we have to make about how you know do how much do we want to resource these important transportation projects. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you, Devin and team for great work. Thanks, Ryan. I think everyone's spoken so at this point, unless there's anything else, I'll entertain a motion. And Devin, if you want to pull that language up, that'd be helpful. Anyone want to take a stab at it? If not, I'll move that TAB recommends finalizing the proposed VZIP project recommendations for staff to implement changes at project sites as necessary in spring 2023. I second the motion. Thanks, Tila. Any further comments? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Let's see, five hands passes unanimously. Thanks, Devin. I'm not sure if you've got this next one, but our fifth agenda item is an update and tab briefing on the Vision Zero Action Plan. Devin, you're muted, but we, you're wait, we're just waiting for you to pull up the PowerPoint. I am so sorry. I could not figure out what was going on, but I had to end my screen share there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I will get on with the next one just a moment. No problem. Here we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that, although that is the end. Thank you for the understanding the technical difficulties there. Um, good evening, my name is Devin Joslin. I'm the principal traffic engineer for the city of Boulder and here tonight to also present an update on the Boulder Vision Zero Action Plan update. I'll point out that I'm joined by our consultant team project manager, Charlie Alexander, who will be available uh, to assist me with questions and answers following the presentation. Again, just a refresher on Vision Zero background and the project purpose. Um, these stats are by no means uh, foreign to us at this point. Um, we know that there is still work to do, um, that between 2018 and 2020, there were nine people killed on Boulder's roadways. Uh, one was riding a bike, two were walking, and six were in a car. 
Um, there were also 150 people that were seriously injured. 25 of them were walking, 55 were on a bike, and 70 were in a car. The prior version of the action plan was intended to cover the years 2019 through 2021. And we've now, uh, throughout this year, uh, been embarking on a, a project to create a new five-year Vision Zero action plan that will cover 2023 through 2027. And we're incorporating uh, additional community engagement, some new analysis methods, and really looking at ways to uh, build on and enhance and improve uh, the prior action plan. I want to highlight uh, briefly on this slide some of the success that we had in 2019 through 2021. Uh, we don't want to discredit uh, the work that we've been doing and continue to do. Um, you'll note here that we've deployed leading pedestrian intervals, left turn changes, and signing and marking uh, changes at 46 intersections. Uh, we've also, as we discussed earlier, implemented the 20 mile per hour residential speed limit. And we've continued to build out the low stress walk and bike network as we're able. Uh, and you'll see in the top right corner there, a very large uh, dollar value. Uh, again, this is just grants one 2019 through 2021. And those amount to $4.8 million. We've also expanded red light cameras to three new locations uh, and issued an average of 13,000 photo radar van citations per year. I also want to share with you uh, a recent effort that speaks to follow through on the previous Vision Zero action plan around data accessibility and transparency. As of last Monday, we have officially launched a crash data dashboard. The launch was promoted through a press release and social media posts. Uh, the link to the dashboard is available on the city's website, and we appreciate the feedback that we've already gotten from some TAB and community members on the dashboard. I wanna let you know that we are actively working with our colleagues in the police department and the innovation and technology department uh, to make some refinements. I'm very proud of the team that brought this dashboard to life and hope that the community finds it a valuable resource. I wanna talk uh, briefly, just reflect back on the first phase of community engagement that we conducted for the Vision Zero Action Plan update. Uh, we're really striving to have inclusive and comprehensive engagement um, to really tie in some of those racial equity plan goals. And we, throughout the first phase, held a virtual public meeting. We had a Be Heard Boulder survey and web map um, that were available in both English and Spanish language. Uh, we met with Community Cycles, the Center for People with Disabilities, as well as the community connectors and residents. We also were very fortunate to have the opportunity to participate in a Spanish language resource fair at San Lazaro Park Properties. And we've been coordinating with city staff in the Innovation and Technology Department on the development and use of a citywide equity index. Um, this index is currently in draft form uh, and it's a five level index that combines measures of racial and ethnic diversity and economic status. Uh, with a category of five representing an area in need of greatest focus for equitable practices. Um, the index combines a combination of factors um, that are still in draft form, but we're, again, we're leveraging this and looking at using that index as a means of aiding our project prioritization process. And I want to point out on this slide as well, uh, there's sort of a heat map of the Be Heard Boulder comments and feedback that we received and you can see that uh, for the most part, it does correspond fairly closely uh, to the CAN network and our arterial streets. Uh, so some of the things that we heard through that first phase of community engagement, um, where we received really over 700 responses to our surveys and, and web map, um, we asked respondents if they had either been or knew someone who had been seriously injured or killed in a traffic crash. And you can see the number there that over a third of respondents uh, had been in that situation. The top traffic safety concerns that were identified among respondents were distracted, driver, distracted driving, drivers not yielding to pedestrians or bicyclists, speeding, 
and drivers and bicycles not sharing the road. Uh, I'll point out that with respect to he, uh, speeding, I believe you're gonna hear from Carl Castillo later in the meeting tonight, um, but Carl has organized and I'll be attending a breakfast tomorrow morning with council members and state legislatures um, to really make the case that we need uh, expanded local control and greater flexibility for use of photo enforcement within the city. Uh, we found that 66% uh, of respondents stated that traffic safety affects the mode of transportation that they choose. And again, as was shown on that uh, heat map on the prior slide, a lot of the top comments came from our arterial corridors. I wanna point out that as part of this uh, action plan update, we're using a technique that's referred to as systemic safety analysis. And this approach really incorporates national best practices and shifts us from a reactive uh, to proactive crash reduction strategies. This allows us to focus more broadly on safety improvements that will be installed at locations across the transportation system uh, versus just at spot locations in response to crash patterns that have already developed. Uh, systemic safety analysis also incorporates corridor level approaches to street design and project selection compared to a focus on improving one intersection at a time. It's also a tool and process that allows us to proactively install countermeasures with the aim of preventing crashes from happening at locations um, prior to them occurring. It, it really puts us in a more offensive uh, versus defensive position to respond to and uh, try to predictively prevent crashes along the system. And you'll see that this systemic safety analysis was really looking at a lot of contextual factors along the roadway uh, system to identify which factors along the roadway system uh, present the most risk and most likelihood of crashes occurring. That's essentially what this slide is trying to convey. Um, you can see across the top, uh, as well as down the sides, this is kind of the matrix of risk factors that the project team analyzed and considered. Um, and you'll see on this slide, the areas where there's kind of the reds and oranges and yellows are the factors that were found to have the highest correlation to the occurrence of crashes. So using all, the, all that data and analyzing uh, through that matrix, uh, we boiled the 61 contextual factors down to the top six. And those are listed here on this slide. Uh, it's things like the zoning, the traffic volume, uh, the type of traffic control at the intersection, um, the speeds along the roadway, as well as whether a multi-use path is present. These next few slides um, convey what we're calling the high risk network, which is the areas along the transportation system where we have five or six of those risk factors on the prior slide uh, overlapping. Um, and you can see largely uh, that it does correspond uh, quite closely to the core arterial network. We have nine of our 18 high risk network corridors uh, that I either overlap fully or partially uh, with core arterial network segments. The other thing that we were considering and uh, comparing our high-risk network to was how it compares to what Dr. Cog has identified as the high-risk network and critical corridors. Uh, in this case, we have 15 of our high-risk network corridors that overlap with the Dr. Cog high-injury network and eight of our high-risk network corridors overlap fully or partially with the Dr. Cog critical corridors. And I believe that that is important uh, and it's important consideration that our analysis uh, flag the same corridors as others uh, because I do think it puts us in an advantageous spot uh, when we propose projects along these corridors. There was already well-established um, data to confirm and sort of justify the need for safety improvements. So in that regard, we're hopeful that projects would be more likely uh, to score favorably when considered uh, for, for grant funding. 
Um, essentially, what the high risk network corridor has led to is a 18 segments, 18 corridors that the project team is analyzing. Uh, and those are shown here in this table. Uh, this table also summarizes a little more clearly uh, whether the corridors we're analyzing uh, overlap with the CAN, Dr. Cog High Injury Network, or Dr. Cog Critical Corridors. Um, so this is really where we're focusing our work, uh, and Charlie can speak more in depth to what they've been doing, but essentially along these corridors they've been doing um, really looking more thoroughly at the, the past five years of crash data um, and looking at the be heard boulder feedback as well uh, and taking all that data and then using um, some highway safety manual analysis methodologies to identify both systemic and site specific countermeasures uh, that are, re are recommended along these corridors. Um, this map on the right with the dots on it, um, those indicate the intersections that were selected for more in-depth analysis using those highway safety manual methodologies that I referred to. And these include things like the use of safety performance functions to determine the level of services safety for the, these intersections based on both the frequency and severity of crashes occurring at an intersection. And the analysis is also performing what's referred to as direct diagnostics. And that is done to identify crash types that are occurring more frequently than expected at the analyzed intersections compared to other intersections of a similar character. Uh, and you can see that most of these intersections are along CAN corridors and the analyses we're, we're performing will serve to inform um, countermeasures that can be layered on to the CAN work. This slide gives a sample of the outputs of the analysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, for each of those 34 intersections that we're analyzing, uh, this table is being produced, wherein which you get uh, some basic information about the intersecting streets, uh, the type, the number, number of lanes, the type of traffic control, um, and then you'll see here this chart, which is referred to as a safety performance function, and these boxes here that show the, the level of services safety. And when you see level of service safety four, that indicates that there's a high potential for crash reduction at the intersection. Uh, the diagnostic patterns indicates those crash types that are overrepresented. In this case, you can see that bicycle crashes are occurring at a higher than expected frequency uh, at Arapahoe Avenue and 30th. Uh, some of the preliminary countermeasures that we're incorporating into the action plan uh, are listed here on this slide. They were also described uh, in the memo. Uh, and it's really things aimed at enhancing um, and reducing conflicts. Uh, I'm sorry, not enhancing conflicts, but reducing conflicts for vulnerable roadway users through things like prohibiting right turn on red, installing protected bike lanes and intersections, making improvements to shared use path crossings, improvements to right turn slip lanes, looking at arterial speed management strategies, upgraded crossings, leading pedestrian intervals. Um, really all these things have been found um, to be proven countermeasures that will have the effects that we're hoping to achieve. In terms of proposed next steps, um, the project team is working currently on uh, making those final analyses of the corridors and completing uh, a benefit cost ratio spreadsheet for the proposed projects. We then plan to layer on the equity index and use that to develop an implementation strategy. Uh, coming up in about a few months uh, in kind of the late January, February timeframe, uh, we're looking at conducting our next phase of community engagement, and that will essentially share our um, proposal for the projects that have been identified and how we've prioritized them. Uh, we plan to come back to TAB in March, 2023, 
and present uh, the draft action plan to city council in April, 2023. That concludes my presentation and Charlie and I are available to answer your questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Devin, for another thorough presentation and really appreciate the data dashboard. That something I know that members of TAB have been interested in and will be a, a thorough, a transparent way of, of showing um, everything that's going on with the community. Um, I also really liked the, um, we're looking not just at our classifying roads by like arterials, but looking at arterials and finding the subset of the subset that is particularly dangerous. And I think that'll be a, a fabulous way for us to make really data-driven decisions. And it's, it's good to hear that that overlaps with some of the regional analysis that's going on, which will hopefully set us up for, um, for grants. That's all I had. Anyone else from TAB have some feedback for Devin and Charlie? Trini? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add as a resource, um, something called Asphalt Art. Um, there's been a lot of research where communities have seen a reduction of 80% of um, pedestrian fatalities just by adding art. And this could create all sorts of visual illusions where you could um, make intersections obviously safer, but even the reduction of the road just by um, a visual, uh, adding that visual. So it's like a really interesting thing and it seems like a cost-effective, easier way. Obviously for our community, it would be uh, seasonal, but but when in place, I think it would be interesting to have as an additional um, resource to the ones that you already suggested. But thank you <laughs> for all. Becky? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I really, uh, really appreciated um, reading about this. I think you know, um, as I was learning about everything going on this year, um, I was sort of, I think, looking for something like exactly what this report is going to be, which is a little more of an accounting of like, of quantifying how much needs to be done to get to, to where we want to go. So we have that ability to sort of measure progress over time. So I think this, um, this, this endeavor will really fulfill that in a way that um, I hadn't seen I haven't seen really fully done in other plans and, and reports um, that I've that I've come across anyway so far yeah so I'm I'm really excited for this work and um, will echo also really appreciate all the work on the the dashboard with the crash data um, that's a great great resource to now have available in public facing so um, thank you to everyone who worked on that and Veronica for keeping me in the loop um, I really appreciate it um, yeah so I'm so I'm really excited to see the um, uh, next version of this um and i and i remember exactly what, what was said in the memo but it's basically describing at some point how you know, we want to um, be realistic about um what is actually feasible as far as you know our ability to work through these different um projects and and tackle um tackle all of this this work over time and that makes a lot of sense um but i also encourage this sort of um to any extent we can help council understand a sort of full accounting for, you know, if we want to reach vision zero, like how much does, is it going to take? And I know we can't know the exact dollar number or number of hours or, or you know, number of amount of work that it will take. But I think with all of the analysis being done here, we'll be able to give them um, a better idea of like what it's going to require. So then when we're talking about funding and resources and whatnot, we can give them that well. You know, this is what we know we can do now with what we have, and this is what it would take to get to where we are saying we want to go. So um, I just kind of support that, both that very realistic accounting, but also a kind of full accounting of what it would take, um, you know, if we had if we had more resources. Um, and then my last, oh, my last last item is just a comment or a question. Um, the list of countermeasures. Um, where do those do those come from the highway safety manual or where where do the specific countermeasures or they just come from all, a variety of resources or uh, I'm just wondering how you decide on those or how you get to those. Yeah, I could start it and then Charlie, if you want to add on, I, I would say 
Charlie and his team have really been uh, looking at a lot of resources nationally. One of them is the Crash Modification Factors Clearinghouse. That's the national listing of countermeasures with uh, data and studies that convey their effectiveness. Um, so I would say that that's one resource. And then um, Charlie, if you wanna add on as well, the, the work that your team's been doing. Sure. Yeah, it, it's a good question. So as Devin mentioned, you know, for, for each of those 18 corridors on the high risk network, we're doing a basically a very detailed review of the crashes to understand what the problems uh, are on those corridors, both historically as well as sort of locations that have similar similar characteristics. So in a lot of cases, we are pulling from different, I'll, I'll say toolkits of countermeasures that are published. FHWA has one called Proven Safety Countermeasures that's pretty well recognized in the industry. Um, the Highway Safety Manual has different countermeasures in them or in it. Uh, and then um, different um, different agencies, jurisdictions, et cetera, have, have sort of put their own toolkits out there. And many of them sort of overlap with a lot of the same things. Devin described the, the crash modification factor clearinghouse, which, which helps tell us for some, but not all of those countermeasures you know, what, what research exists about their efficacy so that we can understand that benefit a little bit more um, and, and, you know, help prioritize better. Um, but that's generally, you know, to describe the process of, of how we're identifying the countermeasures, uh, that's, that's how we're doing it. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to be referencing a variety of resources. Um, I, I'm certainly not familiar with all of them, but um, knowing that different things are created at different times and the guidelines have changed over years. I think that's great. Um, yeah, great to be um, using kind of different, uh, different resources that are out there. So uh, that's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. It sounds like Ryan ran into some internet issues and he's trying to rejoin. So Tila, if you have anything, you're up. Thanks, Alex. Yes. Um, I don't have much substantive, but I, what I would like to just reflect on um, being somewhat long in the tooth on tab at the moment. Uh, I was around when this first iteration of the Vision Zero Action Plan happened. It was part of the TMP update. You know, we as a city tend to aspire to update those, these master plans every five years. I recognize COVID and switching hats multiple times on directors as um, complicated that plan. Um, and so I was pretty gratified that for, for, for me, what seems the most critical thing that came out of the last TMP was our first real uh, announcement that zero is our goal. I love to see that sentence <laughs> in the memo and to say, we can't update everything all at once, but this particular thing, the Vision Zero Action Plan is ripe for updating. We now have a couple of years of perspective um, and learning from other communities and um, different resources to draw from to say, here's what we think we should try for. And we're actually filling in a lot of the gaps that I think um, reflected poorly on our previous Vision Zero action plan. I don't want to besmirch any of the staff effort that went into the earlier plan, um, but in particular, you know, there were 50 items that had no clear prioritization, no real clear, there were very, very vague sort of ex, um, um, timelines about when they might be attainable. Uh, it was like near, short, long. Um, and so just to see a rethinking by staff um, about what is really possible, what should be prioritized. I think this reflects a lot of the um, impetus on um, focusing on the high injury and high speed and uncomfortable arterials that we, we see like really contributing mostly to, to our um, injuries and deaths in this town. We know Lightning doesn't strike the same place twice in most places, but in most cases, but but they sort of rhyme. You know, the the crashes that we're seeing, the injuries that we're seeing, they don't feel like just stabs in the dark. And I'm just so gratified at the staff effort to say, what can we do better? How can we rethink it? How can we prioritize? And how can we be realistic about it? 
Um, and to Becky's point, like, what would it take? Like, how can we paint the picture to, to city council? Like, what would it take to actually achieve vision zero? Um, a lot of sentiment, but I think the Sheena is probably better than anybody here. Uh, what would it take would be kind of a time machine and going back in time and reprogramming how we design our cities and what we accept as uh, you know, a suitable level of traffic, traffic congestion, traffic speeds, motor vehicle, dominance of the roads. So short of reinventing every single arterial road and strode in this town, I think this is a really terrific effort um, at, at making a good case for spending money where money will be well spent and for prioritizing staff efforts on real things that are gonna reduce vision zero. So I'm really gratified. I'm generally kind of um, worried about us using consultants and overusing consultants. I think this is a super wise use of consultant time and effort and, um, and, and sort of pointing staff to what they're good at and what they know and supplementing it with outside experts. So I'm just so pleased with what I've seen so far. So congratulations, Natalie, Devin, Charlie, staff, like this is, such a different flavor of thing than when we had from the last TMP update on the Vision Zero Action Plan. And it really looks like an action plan. Also, Tila, Ryan, welcome back. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Thanks. Yeah, uh, just to pile, I guess, with the with the compliments, uh, Devin and Charlie, and you might, I think this is really nice. And um, I, I think what makes this really great is on slide eight you have these top six risk factors and it doesn't it doesn't exactly read as uh okay here's the six strategies but it sort of implies um the 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 strategic or the priority work that follows and i think this is this is a really powerful uh, statement um, it's the kind of a statement that it, that I'd love to see more of our projects because it allows us to have a conversation at a very high level with um, everybody from city council to the public about the things in plain English or plain language um, that that are important and that that have a huge amount of things underneath them, but just are simple simple things um, that will create. It, the, the change or that will need, need investment for the change we need. Um, uh, at some point, I'd love to, I guess, get to the, the, the single sentence or the paragraph under each one of these um, for, you know, greater consumption, um, I think, with council. Um, but I'm just kind of just gushing a little bit that I think this is really great. I've, I've been a lot, I, I often am, am asking for, for strategic um, ideas like what's what's what are the reasons we're doing things and you have it here and i think it's a really great job um so i just um i don't think i have anything else to say well, thanks ryan and thanks devin and charlie this has been really informative and looking forward to putting this to action thank you with that, thanks with that we'll move on to a briefing on 30th Street and the 28th and Colorado intersection improvements. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Awesome. Michael, you want to do a quick mic check too? Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Cool. All right. Um, thanks for sharing the screen, Melanie. Um, good evening, members of the Transportation Advisory Board. I'm Daniel Sheeter, Senior Transportation Planner with the City of Boulder, and I'm joined tonight by Michael Coslow, Transportation Senior Project Manager. Next slide, please. Tonight, Michael and I will be sharing an update on the department's efforts to make improvements to two core arterial network, or CAN, corridors, Colorado Avenue and 30th Street. The two projects, 28th and Colorado Protected Intersection, and 30th Street multimodal improvements between Colorado and Arapahoe were informed by the 30th and Colorado corridor study and are expected to break ground in summer 2023. Senior transportation planner Nathan Pope last presented an update on these projects back in June 2022. 
Not a lot has changed respective to their final designs, but there has been a lot of activity on adjacent projects along the corridor or along both corridors. We'll start with a very brief background on the corridor study and then quickly walk through the implementation status of delivering the recommendations from the study along the lengths of both corridors over the next five to seven years. Next slide, please. Approved by Council in 2019, the 30th and Colorado Corridor Study examined existing and anticipated transportation conditions and needs and developed designs to improve travel for all modes. Both the 30th Street and Colorado Avenue corridors were identified by the city and CU for detailed study due to their connectors between key activity centers. The corridors contain six of the city's top 10 crash locations at that time. A comprehensive community engagement process included many activities many activities to elicit public input at key decision points as the study was developed. In the past year, TAB, followed by Council, prioritized a connected network of projects on Boulder's arterial streets. Both 30th Street and Colorado Avenue were identified as part of the core arterial network. The goals for the CAN are aligned with the goals identified by the 30th and Colorado Corridor Study. The focus of all projects along both corridors and throughout the CAN is to close gaps in the transportation network by providing safe, comfortable and convenient connections for people wherever they need to go and no matter how they get around. We'll begin with the implementation status of Colorado Avenue moving from east to west. There are currently six completed and active projects along this corridor that are being coordinated to realize the vision from the corridor study. Next slide, please. First up is a new pedestrian crossing east of 33rd Street to connect CU's East Campus to housing on the south side of Colorado. This project is funded for final design and construction in 2023. And you can follow along with the context map. I, hopefully it's not too small, but you kind of see where these, these are sited along the corridor. Next is the 30th and Colorado protected intersection and underpass project. I'm sure everyone has experienced the construction of this project, but it'll be well worth the wait. The project extends, ex extends a few hundred feet in either direction on Colorado and includes two grade separated underpasses, transit stop improvements, and Boulder's first full protected intersection. This was the original rendering, and here you can see the construction progress from the same perspective. The underpasses have been constructed, and even some of the protected corner islands are beginning to take shape if you look closely. This project is anticipated to be complete in early 2023. So pretty close, right around the corner. Since the next, to next topic is a deeper dive into the 28th and Colorado Protected Intersection Project, I'll skip to the west side of 28th with these aerial images of the recently completed Colorado and Region Intersection Improvements Project. An eastbound protected bike lane and multi-use path on the south side of Colorado were constructed extending all the way to the southwest corner of the 28th and Colorado intersection. Finally, the West Colorado Multimodal Improvements Project proposes comprehensive upgrades to the last block of Colorado between Region and Folsom to connect all of the projects to CU's main campus and Folsom Street. As discussed at last month's TAB meeting, the city is seeking TIP funds as part of call for for final design and construction. But wait, there's more. Before we move on to 30th Street, I wanna share details on a major transit improvement that is being coordinated across all of the Colorado Avenue projects. As recommended by the corridor study, the city is planning to implement approximately one and a half lane miles of new business access transit or bat lanes at the conclusion of the 28th and Colorado protected intersection project in late 2023 or early 2024. The lanes will primarily serve over 10,000 riders per day on CU's Stampede route, which operates frequent service between main campus and east campus. Route serving Williams Village will use segments of the bat lanes as well. This great facility will also make key connections to the north-south bound route at newly constructed or soon to be constructed stops at 30th and Colorado. Striping and signage to denote these curbside bat lanes will likely look very similar to Denver's implementation of bus only lanes on South Broadway as shown in the picture. Moving on to 30th, there's so much happening between baseline and diagonal that we've broken the corridor into six segments to make it easier to describe the various projects. Moving from south to north, 
Oh, next slide, please. Moving from south to north, segment one entails improvements to the 30th and baseline intersection. These upgrades are successfully TIP funded for final design and construction and will be delivered by phase two of the baseline road transportation safety project. Segment two runs from the intersection with baseline road to the soon to be completed improvements at the Colorado and 30th intersection. Segment two is seeking TIP funds for final design and construction as part of call four. Segment three is the currently under construction 30th and Colorado protected intersection underpass project. Continuing to move north, next is segment four, the 30th Street Multimodal Improvements Project between Colorado and Arapaho, Arapaho. Michael will present a detailed update on this project in a few minutes. Segment five is improvements to the 30th and Arapaho intersection. While final design will kick off soon, TIP call for funds are not being sought to construct initial improvements at the intersection. Last but certainly not least is segment six, which entails multimodal improvements between Arapaho and Diagonal. This project was successfully TIP funded for preliminary design beginning in late 2023. Let's next look at project updates for the 28th and Colorado Protected Intersection since the last tab update in June 2022. This project picks up right where the 30th and Colorado Protected Intersection stops, uh, the improvements to the 30th and Colorado intersection where they stop and extends improvements all the way through the 28th Street intersection to the approach to Regent Drive. Here's that corridor context map again with the project area highlighted. The project was initially scoped to extend improvements along Colorado from Regent Drive east through the intersection at 28th Street. In May of this year, the project received additional grant funding through CDOT's Revitalizing Main Street's funding program to complete the gap on Colorado between 28th and the western edge of the 30th Street protected intersection, which you could see in the, in the aerial image from a couple of slides ago. The overall project budget is approximately $2.6 million, with around 20% coming from the city. Let's briefly look at the intersection as it is today. We have CU Main Campus and Folsom Field to the west, the 28th Street Commercial District to the north, CU East Campus and the 30th and Colorado Protected Intersection and Underpass to the east, and 28th Street continues as US 36 to the south. It's a complex intersection with the addition of the 28th Street Frontage Road, as well as University Heights Avenue, which is kind of that road uh, coming in at the top left of the image adding additional conflict points at several places. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, the, the improvements extend west to region and east to the approach to 30th Street. The project proposes to construct raised protected bike lanes and protected intersection elements, bat lanes and floating bus stops, as well as the repurposing of the southbound right turn bypass lane to better organize this complex intersection and improve safety and reliability for all. Zooming in on the intersection design as presented to you all in June 2022, there have only been a few minor design updates that were largely informed by TAB's input. I will talk through each of these updates, even though they are not shown on the illustrative plan view on your screen, which is still that June 2022 plan set. Um, but the refinements are relatively minor, so we just kind of maintained uh, this for, for this presentation. First, the striping at the protected corners, outlined in red here, have been refined to better delineate bicycle lanes and waiting areas from pedestrian paths of travel. Markings have also been added to manage conflicts between bicycles and pedestrians. Next slide, please. Next are two transit-related changes. The existing westbound stop at the northwest corner has been removed to improve transit speed and reliability. And the existing pair of stops east of the intersection will be reconstructed as shown in these plans. Also, the eastbound bat lane or bus uh, business access transit lane, um, that striping will begin at the bus stop so that vehicles can merge into the single general purpose travel lane after making the southbound left from 28th Street. This merge area is denoted by the red circle. Finally, the striping of the bat lanes outlined in red will not match the plans presented in, the, in June 2022. Instead of continuous red paint, there will be intermittent red-backed bus-only stencils, as well as a solid red lane line 
running the length of the facility, similar to the South Broadway example shown a few slides ago. So what's next? Pending right-of-way acquisition, construction is slated to begin in summer 2023 with an anticipated completion in late 2023. So I'll now turn it over to Michael for a detailed update on multimodal improvements to 30th Street. Thanks so much. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, members of TAB and everyone else who's still awake and hanging, um, Mike Koslow here, um, Senior Engineering Project Manager who works with Daniel in Transportation and Mobility. And I'm here to talk about the 30th Street Multimodal Improvements Projects. Uh, so the project limits um, are from just north of the underpass project to Colorado Avenue to just south of Arapahoe Avenue. And in addition to the city funding, uh, projects receive grant funding through three separate CDOT grants. And next slide, please. So for project context, similar to 28th in Colorado, this project is, is directly adjacent to the underpass. Uh, this is going directly north from 30th in Colorado. And um, within this project, the project is going to increase uh, bike connections on our CAN network uh, to CU's East Campus, uh, to the right there, uh, to the Boulder Creek Path and to Scott Carpenter Park, um, all within this project. And as Daniel mentioned, uh, the staff started to recognize that 30th Street is gonna get really busy in 2023. And so um, as we're getting other 30th Street projects coming online, this project will also become known as 30th Street Segment 4 in the future. So what do we have today on 30th? Uh, there are travel lanes uh, at a, approximately nine and a half to 10 and a half feet, as you can see in, in, in the uh, cross section. Uh, in addition to that, there's the five foot on-street bike lanes that are directly adjacent to the travel uh, lanes, general purpose lanes, and four to eight foot uh, wide sidewalks. So on the proposed improvements at uh, 30th Street, uh, what we what we was selected was option three, and that was to move, go ahead and move the bike lanes up above the curb to provide that low stress uh, experience for bike riders. Uh, we're also going to widen the sidewalks so they're consistently eight feet wide. And the transit enhancements essentially will be so that there is not the striped bike lane right at the bus stops. The, the uh, bikes will go behind the transit stops. So uh, in addition to that, so we are in, including raised crossings across driveways where we can and at, at Marine Street to the north. Uh, another component of this project right now, the project is um, assigned at 35 miles per hour. There is a speed limit reduction study uh, associated with this project. And in addition to the transportation component, I wanna briefly mention, there is also a ditch a component of uh, putting in raw water from the west side to east side. So basically, if you see a trench going across 30th Street <laughs> um, during construction, that's just associated with the, the ditch uh, to um, extend the McCarty ditch from Scott Carpenter Park on the west to the future east campus of CU. So uh, to the south of Boulder Creek, uh, well, let, me, let me just start by saying we haven't had any substantial changes since June. So uh, the project's considered to be at 90% now. We've, we've gotten the 90% plan submitted in November. And right now what we're doing is applying for that city floodplain permit. And that's a major milestone for the project. Uh, once we, while that's going on, so we're kind of hitting pause in the design, we're working on the floodplain permit and we're working on the right-of-way negotiations phase, similar to 28th in Colorado. And during right-of-way negotiations, we'll approach five entities, including Colorado University to seek easements and license agreements uh, for grading construction on CU property. And um, also the license agreement um, talks about the mitigation of existing CU parking spaces that unfortunately are, um, are a consequence of the project. And uh, so while we're also doing that, sorry, slow down a minute. Um, the, one of the other things that we're doing is coordinating a bid for the public art component of the project, which is kind of fun and we'll make it a, a little bit nicer. Um, so going to the north of Boulder Creek, I guess we go, so that's, and you all have seen these slides, it's the same as June, so I can keep moving here on, on the, so we go to the next one to the north of Boulder Creek. Um, so since then, we've refined some design details, um, including the two uh, retaining walls that are proposed on the project and two rain gardens that were previously approved. And then um, you can see the southbound bike lane gets into Scott Carpenter Park. So another detail that we're working on is the lighting of 
uh, that path so it gets away from the corridor of the street and uh, street trees. And it's hard to imagine tonight that someone might be warm in July or August, but that that could be uh, the case. So, um, so right now uh, that's kind of where where we're at with the proposed design. And then looking into the project's budget, this also hasn't changed since June. It's anticipated that approximately three quarters of the budget for the project would be through the three CDOT grants and a quarter would be through city funding. Similar to 28th in Colorado, we're looking at construction starting next summer, again, pending the city floodplain permit and the acquisition of the five parcels of right away. And because the project has some landscaping, we anticipate it will extend into summer or spring 2024 uh, to get those uh, components of the project installed. So what are kind of the next steps here for the, these projects? Um, in, in summary, so once we are done with the projects, and I can probably go one more slide, um, the, uh, these will compete complete significant segments of the two vital corridors on the core arterial network. Uh, the projects will provide nearly a centerline mile of continuously protected bike lanes or protected intersections, a mile and a half of bat lanes, business access transit lanes, the projects will also serve to connect University of Colorado, main campus, East Campus, Scott Carpenter Park, the Boulder Creek Path, three B-cycle bike share stations, and over 6,000 residents. And tonight we were hoping to see if you have any questions regarding the status or the process and schedule of these two projects. So we're, that's the end of our presentation and we're here to answer any questions. Thanks, Michael and Daniel. Uh, Tila, do you have a question? I do, thanks. Michael and Dan, and uh, good slide driving, Melanie. Uh, I have uh, questions for both of you. The basic question is, where do the bicyclists go? So my first question was looking at slide. Well, the bat lanes on um, Colorado um, from Folsom to Discovery. I'm looking at the at the photograph and I'm looking at the schematic and I don't understand. We have just um, enabled cyclists all the way down to 28th, but then what do they do in this segment here? Because it looks like bus only and then there's parking to the right and it's kind of cramped vehicle access. So where are bikes on that segment? We can, would you, I can respond to that one, Tila, first. Please, um, yes. Yeah, on on this project, and actually the cross section is is um, with the exception of the the bat lanes, you know, fairly similar, I think, between both projects. So the the mm -hmm. bike lane here is raised above curb level, so kind of sidewalk level. So it's looking um, like the multi-use path on the south. Um, I think a similar, at least on the south side of Colorado, I think that that uh, width of of you know a wider sidewalk slash multi-use path and then adjacent mm -hmm. raised protected bike lane continue there kind of where Melanie's cursor is. Um, oh, I can't see wait. Melanie's cursor. Hold on, let me switch views here. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, nope, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so okay, so that's feeling like multi-use pathy. No, well, they're they're at the same grade, but the the bike lane is, is designated um, you know, with stamped or, or red concrete with a buffer between the So it'll the, feel the like the Broadway bike lane-ish, um, like adjacent to university, to, to the I university. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, with a little bit, I think a little bit wider buff or slightly wider buffer here um, between the two. Um, between peds and bikes. Yeah, and then and then the difference here also is that the bike lane is is as uh, only going in one direction, so it's only eastbound. An right. eastbound bike lane, yep. next to a to a shared path, or you know, I, I would expect probably primarily pedestrians in that multi-use path, um, uh -huh. since we'll have these high-quality bike lanes in both directions. Um, but that's kind of the, the the it'll be raised at sidewalk level, though. Is okay. Kind of the, um, the big um, the big benefit. I love your aspirations separated. that it's only yeah. going to be eastbound, but I'll tell you functionally, it's going to be both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the width on that, but okay, that, that really helps clear it up. Thank you. Um, and then my other question was about crossing 30th Street along Scott Carpenter Park. I've raised this kind of every time it's come before us, um, but we know that 
the underpass, it's got Carpenter Park going under 30th Street regularly floods. It's one of the first ones to flood um, in spring runoff that we got kind of lucky this last spring. Um, but in general, it's not only one of the first ones, it's also one of the most problematic ones because the workaround for cyclists uh, and walkers using that multi-use path is to divert all the way over to Arapaho Avenue. Have we given up on giving them a mid-block crossing now when the, that uh, underpass is unavailable? Yeah, I, thank you for bringing that to you. Yes, in fact, I hate to say, I, would, I, don't, I wouldn't hate to say you use the word giving up. I would I say- I know, that's we, why I we, used we, we it, yes. At, <laughs> <laughs> we looked at, a, uh, we looked at the, the, the data there, were there, were there crashes along that corridor? And in the five-year history, there were no bike crashes at that location recorded. Now I'm the new employee, so I can't speak to that when it flooded in previous years. Um, but I know that there have been improvements to the channel in the past year that ah. I think helped us a little bit this spring. Also our lack of rain. <laughs> um, so I'm fully, you know, it, but what we've started to recognize was putting in any sort of mid-block crossing during that 95 to 99% of the time when it's not needed and there's a really much safer crossing underneath might encourage people to actually cross that grade. And, uh, and that's the reason why we did do it. So I, I wouldn't say it's that we gave up on it. It's that we deliberately looked at it, checked to see if there's an actual safety issue, if there's been crashes there, and then start to recognize, hey, maybe during the rest of the time, it'd be, it, it might cause problems. So like that, it's not that we haven't looked at it. We looked at it, we can share that data with you, <laughs> but that's how we got to that conclusion. At the, at no, the it's, it's refreshing to actually get an answer to a question that I've asked multiple times. Um, I, I disagree it's 99% of the time, but it is a, a majority of the time, the underpass is the preferable um, crossing for, for anybody using that area. And it's really only out of necessity that we do see cyclists and pedestrians sort of playing frogger there. Um, but I will note for the record, at times, pedestrians and cyclists play frogger at that location when they are unexpectedly uh, unable to use the underpass for that 40 feet <laughs> and do not wish to divert more than 250 feet from their intended path to a, a safer at grade crossing at Arapaho Avenue. Um, so I suppose uh, I will accept for now your judgment. I'm glad you looked at it and I appreciate hearing that. Um, but I'm going to keep noticing what's happening and I think we'll just have to see how this pans out and what, what user behavior is in the future at this True. location and we might be looking at a an um, RFB there at some point in the future yes. but thank you for closing the loop on that sure. that's all I have thanks Tila I was also wondering about this stretch here in the past I know the city has encouraged people to park on some of the university property on the east side of the street here when Scott Carpenter parks parking fills up and the recommendation as to than to cross the street by again walking all the way to the to the underpass or Arapaho. Uh, is there an opportunity to fit some sort of marked crossing somewhere along here between the um, the creek and Arapaho to get people safely to the park? I, I would I would say that the the, the, the the quick answer is it's not part of the project. But it isn't something we can't look into. And in a similar fashion, we, we took a look at the, uh, the crossing volumes that were recorded there. And I would be leaning on, on the operations team, Veronica and, and, and Davin, who did that study. But in reality, um, they went through and did an analysis to determine using our pedestrian crossing guidelines, should there be a crossing there in between the creek and Arapaho? And it determined there was, there, it wasn't needed. Again, we're glad to provide you that data. That, that's the conclusion we came to for this project. That being said, there isn't anything that would preclude us from putting something in the future um, at that location. Okay, that's that's helpful background and hopefully something that you consider. Um, I think um, I think this the street has all sorts of opportunity for changing how people travel along it, walking, biking. Um, I think transit's incredibly undertapped along this corridor, and so the current usage might not trigger the need for a, a crossing with based on our guidelines, but aspirational, I think this, this corridor can achieve that. Um, yeah, this has been great. It's exciting to see the, the network come together. And I think you've done a fabulous job with these graphics to not only communicate the, the vision for the final network, but really thoroughly explained 
a pretty complex situation where you have a ton of linear projects and intersection projects and how the, they're going to come together in the timeline for that. So I imagine this will be really helpful as more construction starts to, to communicate that to the to the community who's going to be asking questions. And I'll add that I think this is some of the by far the most thoughtful um, transit infrastructure I've, I've seen in my time on tab. This is we're really thinking about why certain bus stops go where and in addition to carving out space for them. So I think this will um, speed buses up and the, the benefits of all the stops and everything will be will be felt by by people riding the bus. The only other question I had was about B cycle stations. This is a pretty abstract question. Have you thought about throughout these corridors places where we could have dedicated micromobility parking, whether it's fixed stations for bike share or corrals for scooters, things like that? Uh, we, we didn't really explore that on this project uh, to be fully completely transparent. Um, there is a, a parking spot for B-Cycle at Marine uh, Street right next to the B-Cycle share there. Um, when the project is completed, you can see the uh, the bike lane is gonna cut through that existing box for the B-Cycle share, or excuse me, for uh, the line scooters. So the intention is to move that over um, so that it's along 30th Street. Uh, but that that work is actually done by the scooter company. So I don't I don't want to speak to that. But yes, we have provided room for them to do that within this project. So we aren't going to lose that spot. Um, other other than that, we've been in contact with the B cycle station uh, folks in fully recognition that that's going to be a really nice micro mobility spot. <laughs> I don't want to call it a station there, right? With the transit stop, a B cycle station, and a bike facility right there. Awesome. Yeah, it'd be great whenever we have existing bikeways or places where we know a lot of people are going to be boarding and alighting buses if we if we think how we can plan for the future of mobility there. But yeah, this has been awesome. Any other TAB members with any feedback or questions? Becky? Thanks. Um, yeah, a lot of really exciting work in in all of these projects. Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed the June meeting, so I'm hopefully not repeating <laughs> something that came up there, um, but I might be. I, I just was wondering about at 28th and, and Colorado, um, if if there is a reason why, like it seems like a really long pedestrian crossing distance. They have to cross quite a few lanes um, on if they're going across Colorado. And I'm wondering like what decision-making was there, um, not having like an island or something to shorten that distance at that intersection when all this other work was being done. Thanks, Becky. I can take a quick crack at that. And and um, Garrett Slater could also chime in too. I think, yeah, there is there's a lot of uh, a lot of modes being accommodated in this intersection and, and it's it's pretty complex with the with the 28th Street movements, Colorado and the frontage road as well. Um, and I think there's some challenging trade-offs kind of to make in that context. Um, but I think the protected intersection itself is is shortening those crossing distance crossing distances um, to to some extent and helping with um, you know kind of providing those refuge islands at the corners. Um, and I would note the the um, the removal of the southbound right uh, bypass lane at the top left of that plan view. Or let's see if Melanie can find it. Thank you, Melanie. Um, that is also really improving the condition for pedestrians kind of coming out from the multi-use path connecting to Boulder Creek, um, as well as the sidewalk continuing west and, and destinations to the south there. So I think that was a big benefit to this design. But um, yeah, the, the uh, acknowledge that the, the turn pockets and, and uh, are contributing to the, the width of the crossings here, especially across Colorado. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other feedback or questions from Tab? Just, Ryan. just briefly. This is great. I, uh, I don't have a lot to add on the question. I think Dan, you and, and uh, Michael are doing a great job. This is really exciting to see this whole thing coming together. I, and I like the way that um, you've involved Tab. Uh, in the way that you've involved TAB over the, the, the recent months on this project, uh, we can communicate about this, I think, with a, with a lot of um, 
understanding and uh, it's really exciting. So let's, let's do five more projects like this soon. And I just want to thank you guys um, for all your work. And like Alex said, I mean, I think this will answer the graphics and the way you, the visuals are so, so well done that I think they'll answer a lot of community questions moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of a first run of, of, kind of presenting in this way with you all here tonight. So I appreciate the mm -hmm. feedback. Thank you. I just want to note, uh, I got a message from Garrett. I can't find it, but <laughs> to answer my question earlier about the width of, uh, of the sidewalk slash multi-use path, he, he responded in the chat somewhere, <laughs> or maybe texted <laughs> me, I don't know, <laughs> uh, eight feet uh, and occasionally 10 feet. Um, so it seems a bit slender to me, but I understand there's a lot of constraints on, on, the, on the space here. And mostly what I was hoping for was something bigger than six feet. So thanks for that, Garrett. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, Daniel. Michael, this is, this is fabulous. And Michael, it's nice to meet you. With that, we'll move on to matters. First, matters from staff. And I'll turn to Natalie for what you all have. Yes, thank you. All right, we have one item tonight. Um, Let's see, and Carl Castillo, I believe, is with us. There he is. Yes, Hi, Carl. Um, Hi. So I'm going to hand it off to Carl. He's here to give you the 2023 um, city legislative priorities. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair uh, is it Weinheimer and um, members of TAB. Delightful to be able to present before you this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen, share a PowerPoint presentation that I've created. So give me one second. Okay, looks like I'm mostly there. Give me one more second. Um, okay, are you able to see the uh, PowerPoint and hear me okay? Great. Okay, well, thank you. I, so my name is Carl Castillo. I'm the Chief Policy Advisor. I work in the City Manager's Office. And I want to provide you a very brief uh, presentation this evening. Um, Essentially, I wanted to give you an overview of the policy statement that council adopts every year, and they just recently adopted it, and the positions that are included, um, the principles and the priorities are included, specifically focusing on transportation matters. Um, and also, what, what kind of bills we might expect in 2023 that, are, that might be of interest to, uh, to this board. Uh, so starting off with the purpose and use of the policy statement. Um, Many of you may already know this, but we, we create this policy statement to give direction to basically city officials uh, so that they can advocate before a variety of uh, intergovernmental entities and have a unified um, position on, you know, where does the city stand on this policy or that policy? Um, and by doing so, it allows us to be a lot more nimble um, and proactive and, and, and be part of the process rather than having to wait before we go before council, which is especially at the state house, nearly impossible given the speed that things move. Um, but I wanted to just go through the list of some of the organizations. So first it, it is a, the policy statement is for regional, state and federal when it's regional level, there are groups like Dr. Cog and RTD that of course you're well familiar with that have quite the impact on the city. At the uh, state level, we have our state legislators in the General Assembly, and of course, we have the governor and the various agencies. Um, so CDOT would be perhaps the most uh, relevant one to tab. Um, and at the federal level, again, we have our congressional rep representatives, 
or two senators and, and Congressman the Goose. Uh, but of course, all the um, <clears throat> executive um, departments. So um, uh, occasionally we do actually reach out to the White House. We're actually in the process of doing that right now for an issue that pertains to resilience. But generally speaking, it's, it's, it's the various agencies. And as Natalie knows, uh, we'll be visiting <clears throat> with our uh, congressional members um, as part of the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition. Um, I think it's uh, mid-February. And finally, we do actually reach out, uh, or I should say, um, from, on a judicial level, uh, we sign out to ex party. Um, we sign on as ex party members to certain issues that, while they could be seen as legal and they are legal if you're an actual party member, if you're signing as an ex party member, that uh, parte, that you're actually more of a, engage you more in advocacy. That, that issue doesn't really seem to come up too much in, in the transportation world. So, um, in terms of how this is created, um, we first would look at the outcome of the previous year's policy making decisions that have been made. So after the end of the last state session, state house session, we started working on revisions. We go before council's intergovernmental affairs committee. They have four members that sit on that committee. Uh, we then uh, seek input from council. Uh, they give us some uh, direction and we make some changes. And we, and, and we just most recently brought it to them for approval and secured that approval on November 17th. So tomorrow morning, we're going to be uh, presenting the um, policy statement to our state legislator. So Representative-elect Joseph, uh, Representative Amabwe, and Senator uh, Fenberg will be there, along with most, if not all, of our council members. And then we'll be talking specifically on the priorities, about the priorities that the council has identified. Um, we also make revisions to the policy statement, and we're already scheduled to go before council on January 26th. That allows us to take into account issues that will have been introduced that we weren't able to anticipate and to get some direction from council at that point. So in terms of who's doing the advocacy for the city, it includes myself and it includes Laurel Witt from the city attorney's office. We also have two lobbyists uh, that have a full-time presence at the Capitol, uh, head of water strategies. And then we have two at the federal uh, level as well. Um, so ultimately though, it is our, our city council members who oftentimes are our chief advocates. Um, legislators will often expect to hear from the mayor, mayor pro tem or a council member, um, especially when we're doing, when we're testifying. Um, occasionally it's others though. A lot of times, you know, I, I've had Devin uh, come testify on a um, distracted driving bill because he was very much the expert. Um, so the, the short story is that depending on who's in the best position to advocate for an issue, we may ask him to do so, but we will do so in a way that is coordinated. So we're not having a fragmented, um, you know, one council member saying this and one staff member saying that. My role at the, at the city is to try to make sure that we're communicating with one voice. Um, ultimately, we also, as I said, we rely on, on departmental experts. So Devin is an example. Um, transportation is, is probably one of the departments that we, we work with the most in terms of helping them with intergovernmental advocacy. They're involved, um, as I just mentioned, at, at uh, regional, state, and federal levels. And it's, it's just the nature of transportation that, of course, it crosses boundaries. And we're relying on a um, variety, variety of agencies and, and other uh, governmental entities to complete our uh, regional priorities. Um, we also rely, well, well, let me put it this way. Uh, of course, as one city among many, it's hard to have too much of an impact. Now, we, we of course know that Boulder punches above its weight class, um, but in addition to that, we have to turn to coalitions uh, to really make um, a lot of a difference. So sometimes we build those coalitions depending on, on what the bill is. Sometimes we turn to coalitions that are already in existence. So for transportation, the, the two best examples are um, Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition um, and the Metro Mayor's Caucus, um, and sometimes the Colorado Municipal League as well can really be allies. And so we're trying to shape their agenda, what position they take, um, so that we can leverage our position and be more effective. Um, 
have bars lock in the pocket. Um, so we, we this year we decided to, uh, in addition to just have positions, we, we've identified some certain policy principles that apply to all of our positions. And so they include important issues like equity and, and, and racial justice and collaboration and local control. So local control is an important one to highlight. Um, this is going to come up this year. Um, all things being equal, we'd like to retain the ability for our city council and our boards and commissions to make the decisions and make the recommendations. We, we are reluctant to yield that to uh, other governmental entities, certainly if it's an unfunded mandate. But as uh, we all know, there are issues that uh, can only be addressed or need to be addressed at a higher level. And environmental issues tend to be just those issues. Uh, so there are, while our principle is protect local control, uh, we have certainly some positions that identify that we're willing to yield that authority and maybe have the state provide a, a floor for what the standards are and allow it, the, the cities to go beyond that floor. Um, so what I did here is I took an excerpt from the, uh, the table of contents from the policy statement that relates to transportation. So you'll see you'll have positions 59 through 67 and briefly summarized, I kind of highlighted them, um, you know, it has to do with the funding, advocating for funding, advocating for the completion of the Northwest Rail, for access for vulnerable populations, for complete streets, maintaining our ability to control how our sidewalks are used. And th this dates back to uh, when segways was actually more of a challenge. Now, of course, we have um, a lot of e-bikes and, and other uh, vehicles that uh, are an issue. Um, position 65 is one to look at because that's what I'm going to speak about in particular, which is our ability to um, actually no, 65 is, is has to do with automatic vehicles, and we we wanted to make sure that that is deployed in a way that is in furtherance of our sustainability goals. Um, 66 is the one that I want to point your attention to. I know you just had a chance to uh, hear from Devin on the Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, and as part of that, we're, we're advocating for changes at the State House that would help, help us um, address uh, th th those objectives. Um, and then finally, we're always trying to uh, help shape the governance and, and the oversight provided over RTD to help them be as effective as they can be and to make sure that we can um, we can be a, uh, a partner with them. Um, in terms of state policy priorities, these are priorities, what a priority is as opposed to a position. Positions are always there and we can turn to them as needed when bills or, or regulations are proposed and, and we will then be able to know what the city's position is. We adopt four state priorities and three federal, or at least we did this year, to focus on those issues where we think we can make the greatest change, th those that we want to spend our efforts proactively, um, you know, recognizing we have limited political capital and how much we can actually ask our, uh, our, our senators and representatives to do. And in terms of uh, transportation, we included in increasing travel safety. And um, Devin is actually going to be at our state legislative breakfast tomorrow morning, making the pitch that the city needs increased flexibility to use photo radar cameras to stop speeding. Um, I know that you all know that there is limitations on where they can be used. And um, for many, many years, we've been trying to defend the authority to continue to use both red light camera and photo radar. Uh, many civil libertarians, including a lot of Democrats, have uh, have said that uh, it's been abused. Um, all along, we think that Boulder is an example where it's been used most effectively, the most transparency, the most due process, the revenue that we garner from this is, is usually about the same that we use to pay for the program. So it can't be argued that it's a fundraising uh, effort. Um, so we think we're a primer, a, a, we're in a good position to be advocating for this kind of change. Um, we made this a priority after we heard that Bicycle Colorado wanted to uh, pass legislation. In fact, they had drafted a bill that was put forth before the Transportation Legislative Review Committee this summer 
And it did give in, uh, increased flexibility for cities uh, to use um, this technology on arterials. Unfortunately, it also created a lot of limitations and they were, they were trying to get ahead of the game and address the opposition that they were expecting to see. We thought it was some of those um, provisions that were, were way too limiting and frankly were not ones that we would be willing to agree to. So we, we have since worked with them to give them some changes that we think would make for a better bill. We're hoping that they will continue to be willing to introduce it. We think they'd be a great sponsor. Um, you know, it's a statewide entity that, of course, um, by, by, by their own mission, focus on vulnerable users, uh, bicyclists, and of course, that overlaps with the interest of pedestrians uh, very often. So we will wait and see if they will uh, champion this, and if so, we'd like to be a, a close partner with them and trying to get Howard Municipal League to support it as well. Um, if they don't, uh, we'll see if we can take a role of making this happen with building our own coalition. So one way or another, we'd really like to see this go forward. Um, so what, what this is right here is an excerpt from the actual policy position. So there's policy statement, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a policy priority, which I just showed you. And then this is, this is referring to the specific policy position, position number 66, which highlights the need to expand our authority to use the technology. Um, of course, it includes other things such as um, prohibiting the use of uh, electronic devices um, unless they're hands-free while driving. We're hoping that that comes forward as well again. And if so, we'd like to be uh, part of the coalition to help make it pass. Um, you probably know that it's it's been proposed and it's been killed in recent years. It's been quite frustrating. There's uh, different perspectives on, on why that's happened, but we think that there could be a possibility to have that go forward this year. Um, one of the tools that we're using, um, so of course we have this policy statement and it's, it's a big booklet. And frankly, we can't possibly expect that busy legislators or policymakers are gonna be reading through it. It, um, it's, uh, it's, it's fortunate that you even get your time to, to show this. But uh, what we sort of to do is create these one-pagers, which we're calling policy snapshots on issues that are particularly important to the city. Um, and that's are complicated and they oftentimes overlap multiple departments. So in this case, it'd be police, it'd be transportation, it could be public works as well. Um, and so uh, tomorrow morning, I'll be handing out these uh, uh, four snap snapshots on different topics. One of them will be on Vision Zero. So this, I'm happy to send an electronic copy to you as well so that you can use it in any communications that you have. It's not intended for internal use. Uh, it's, it's presumed that people that serve on TAB, on the city council, know this stuff already. It's primarily for an external audience uh, that would like to get the information succinctly shared with them. Uh, nonetheless, um, if, if you find it useful, we can certainly share it with you as well. Um, so what do we expect in 2023? Well, of course, we talked about hopefully getting some flexibility on speed enforcement cameras. A big one that you are probably hearing about is the governor is interested in introducing at least one bill, if not a series of bills, that would declare land use to be a matter of both local and state interest. It'd be a matter of state, uh, state and local interest. Um, why? Because um, the state, the governor at least, and, and his, his um, uh, a variety of departments that work underneath him, including uh, his, his energy department and transportation and his, uh, and the uh, CDPHE, um, all believe that um, the issues with limiting growth in, in cities and especially not having compact development is preventing us from having the affordable housing, from having the climate mitigation, and from having the uh, transit-oriented development and, and you know, walking uh, type of community that, that uh, is necessary. Now, that being said, you probably also know that this has traditionally been one of the most dearly guarded 
uh, authorities of local governments is to make these decisions on zoning, on land use development, and of course on um, well, you know tax policy. I guess might be the other one. So it's it's going to be a really interesting conversation. On the one hand, I think the governor has a lot of uh, he's got the environmentalists supporting him on this. He's got a lot of the business community, of course, the uh, builders and real estate development. Our own council, I know our mayor is certainly interested in exploring what what these bills are going to look like. At the same time, most municipalities, and it may be ours, are, are going to oppose this. Um, just saying, you know, they're, they're going to say, it's not that we don't want to promote affordable housing and TOD. We don't want it to be, we don't want the state to tell us how to do it. So I bring that to your attention. Um, it's probably something that you've already thought about and I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on, on that issue. Um, finally, um, there had, there are, there's at least one community this, that has asked to pass legislation that would close some statutory loopholes that have allowed uh, vehicles to pass inspection, if I understand, and would, if, without having mufflers, which is, which is amazing to me. Um, or if, if that's not exactly accurate, I think at the very least, the uh, police are limited in the tools that they have available to stop vehicles that are basically making a lot of noise and that are creating a nuisance. This goes hand in hand with our desire to also have increased authority for uh, police or just let's just say the state or, or the counties and the cities to spot vehicles that are polluting. So a lot of times when you have no muffler and Jake brakes, good chance that you might be you might have by, bypassed some of your uh, emissions uh, controls as well. Bring it up because I think it has some relevance to transportation. But uh, finally, you all know, of course, that the legislation was passed and then regulations were implemented or, or, or were adopted by uh, CDOT to create a greenhouse gas emission um, budget um, for every region. And uh, now the question is, how do we get that implemented through Dr. Cog? Um, and so that is going to be a big part of uh, what we work on in 2023 as well. Oh, one more. Um, so we have a lot of new money that's been made available to us through the infrastructure law that passed uh, later, uh, um, I think it was late this summer, early this fall, um, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of this is going to take some time to go through USDOT and F the various agencies, and they have, for the most part, not even created the grant programs that would allow us to pursue these, these funding uh, options. Um, so we will be, in fact, we're actually hiring somebody who's going to help us to identify some of these grant opportunities. We have federal lobbies that can help us pursue applications and get the political support and also to meet with the agencies to make sure that we can submit um, applications that have a good chance to succeed. So with that, I think that concludes, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, what we can expect in 2023. Um, so thank you for your time. I'm glad to answer any questions or if you have any comments. Thanks, Carl. Anyone from TAB have any questions or comments? Sheila? Thank you. Hi, Carl. It's good to see you again. Um, no idea if you remember me. I think last time you and I spoke, we were on a call about trying to change some of the statewide limitations on speed enforcement cameras. So, right, that's uh, right. right. Delightful to hear that there's been progress and that's like top priority tomorrow. Um, great job, Devin. Uh, I really hope it goes well. Um, I, I don't have anything to add from from that conversation a couple of years ago, but just you know to to say I, I appreciate that it's still on the radar, uh, and that Bicycle Colorado is willing to carry the banner for that. Um, you know, it was quite a, a surprise, a pleasant surprise that the Idaho stop got uh, implemented last year, two years ago now. Um, so I'm really hopeful that some you know more control for local authorities who want to implement. Uh, more speed reduction and automated reduction cameras without a whole bunch of the 
odd handcuffs <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and shackles that come with that enforcement mechanism, I would really uh, encourage that to be a primary push. Um, so pleased to see it. Thank you very much for that work. Um, hi, Carl. Thank you so much for, like Tila said, bringing this forward. And I just want to add, um, and I'm going to be presenting an update for the World Day of Remembrance event. And that this year, I mean, each year, it comes with an ask for each community. When, when a community hosts an event for the World Day of Remembrance, we tie it with a specific ask. Our ask in Boulder was um, <laughs> exactly for, uh, on, on, on behalf of the cameras of the, oh my gosh. And so if you need any support, I would be more than happy to, oh. to, to speak up as a, you know, I'm a crash survivor and I've been working on this with other national organizations with a different hat, but um, so I'd be more than happy to help if oh. there's. Yeah, no, I would love to speak with you about that. And I guess, what does the day of remembrance have to do with this? For crash victims. So oh, it was last um, November 20th this year. It's the third third um, Sunday of November. And okay. so we had, I'll, I'm going to present later, but but it has to do because as a national organization, I joined forces with three others and we had over 60 events um, nationwide and each event was tied to a different ask in their community. Okay. Um, so I, I would love to follow up with you. That's that's a, a powerful story and, and, and position that we've been asked to take. And yeah, I'd love to follow up with you and, and, and see how we can um, take advantage of the what you bring to this conversation and, and, and your experience and your knowledge on it. So if, if it's okay with you, I'll probably ask Natalie offline to get your, your number so I can speak no, with absolutely. you. No, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Trini. Brian? Carl, thank you for making the time. Um, you, you said you were going through the agenda for what to expect in 2023. Uh, I think it all looks great. In fact, I think the way both the, the, the substance of what you're advancing here and how you're doing it all seems really great. Um, so thank you for moving this all forward. Um, you had said, I think you said something about on number two, the statewide land use and zoning regs. Um, and you just, I, I like the way you put it, how the compact development is, this is important for a number of reasons, including climate action and getting transportation equity right. Um, maybe didn't use those exact words, but um, it, but, but then this is not easy. This is not easy work. And um, so I, I'm glad to see the coalitions you're, you're, um, that we're working with. And it's just such an important area of work if we can get enough of a caucus or a coalition of municipalities to get state legislation done to drive more compact infill development that will allow the multimodal, you know, biking, walking um, grids that we need. So um, just just rooting for you there. And uh, <laughs> um, but I think the co yeah, the coalitions become really important for that coalitions of cities, coalitions of, of, of the NGOs. And there's and because there's a million reasons why this is important. And um, there's just so many good reasons for it. So um, um, there's that. And then I wanted to just comment on, uh, oh, to say that the GHD rule, I look forward to hearing more about how we implement that and get it figured out. I think it's really exciting that we're going to be working on it. Um, my question, and I'll just ask one, is um, the, the, ones, the one thing that I don't see, that I see in the priorities from previous years, but not moving ahead, is on our TD, maybe not priorities, it was policy positions. Um, and it just, it feels to me like there's this really kind of um, complicated, if, if, if there's a complicated issue that's not represented, that's important, which is not represented in the looking ahead to me, yeah. is how, how we get transit funded here in Boulder. Um, we should be talking about quadrupling the number of, the, you know, our level of, of transit service, but instead we're, you know, having to fight to even get back to where we were a, a few years ago. And there's a lot of really good reasons why from a regional perspective, Funding shouldn't be going to Boulder um, as, as, as much as it should other communities. So um, not to give you too hard of a question this late at night, but like I'm just wondering if you have any great, great ideas or things we should be talking about um, with TAB on how to how do we get transit funded here so that we actually have a 15 minute city where people can hop on buses spontaneously and we don't have to wait an hour for a bus. 
Sorry, I know this is like a super hard question, but I guess I'm just sort of teeing it up. Is yeah, um, no, I mean it's 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 a very valid question. Of course, <laughs> we all want to, at the very least, restore the transit service the way it was prior to the pandemic, and go quite a bit from there. So we have a position on funding, um, and that's that's always a huge one. Um, on the one hand, we've made a lot of progress. Like I said, the federal infrastructure law, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the uh, Recovery Act money that the state has allocated and the fees that they've uh, recently started to collect have all kind of moved the discussion of creating new transportation funding device um, um, tools off the radar for now. Uh, there was, for example, discussion about creating a you know an RTA uh, or a metropolitan transit district, which would be a little bit different than RTA in terms of who, who would have to opt in or opt out. Um, uh, and of course, I think the, um, well, you know, the county just passed a tax measure as well. Um, so bottom line, it's, it's always on our mind. Um, I think there's not as much attention being given to it right now because of all the successes that did come place, that, that did take place. Bottom line though, we, we still don't have nearly enough for the transit needs that we have. Um, so I guess I just want to confirm to with you that it's, it's, it's top of mind, even if it's not a top of, even if I don't see those opportunities coming up right now, it's something that I know it's important to us and we will always be looking out for that. Great, thanks. Please, please come see us again soon. And let us know if Cap can help with any of this from you know communicating this council standpoint, which is part of our job. So thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else from Tab? Becky? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree to what Ryan just said. If there's any way we can help support, um, yeah, we'd love to provide that. Um, and also echoing his sentiment around the state um, taking a role in land use and zoning. I, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard to achieve our goals for bicycling and walking and transit without that kind of reform. And it's so difficult for local legislators to make happen as we see yeah. over and over again. And so I think the state providing the cover by taking that initiative is beneficial. Um, it is just really beneficial to our transportation goals and reaching them faster. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my, my stance on that issue. Um, I, I have one question, which is around, um, uh, I'm curious if, I mean, there's maybe one or two states that have passed um, state level complete streets. I mean, I, I saw you, it, it had, it mentioned in your document, encouraging. I'm wondering if you've heard at any point discussion of the state talking about like uh, mandates where it's built into state, the state operations that when you build a state road, you know, it has facilities for all modes of travel or when they repave a road, it has facilities for all modes of travel on state roads. I'm curious if you know much about that, if you've heard much about that, if that's something that's been considered. It's, yeah. Related to the greenhouse gas legislation, but more of a, a little maybe yeah. more strict. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, there is a requirement by CDOT that uh, when you build a toll road, it has to be a managed lane. That it, that includes uh, oh, an HOV. Um, so there are instances where you know the state comes down and says, "Thou shalt do it if you're going to do anything at all." Complete streets. I would say that's probably more of a carrot approach with uh, doc, if, if Dr. Cog is gonna support your TIP funding application, uh, even more so now that it has to comply with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I would imagine uh, a complete street would score better, not because it's ideological, but hopefully because it'll be analyzed and, and, and determined to do so. Um, beyond that, I suppose that too could be one of many ideas that the governor might propose. I think the, the primary focus of the, the, the land use as a matter of state interest, as a shared state interest, is primarily, at least from a public perspective, focusing on the affordable housing aspect. It's, if you talk to people about like the biggest issues in Colorado, affordable housing, the lack of housing is, I think it's like the number two issue that, that they mentioned. Um, so I think it's partly strategic that they're choosing, choosing that, but to the extent that we know that they really care a lot about the environment and transportation, they could very well introduce bills that speak towards, you know, thou shall make your 
projects this way or that way. I think I think you're going to be quite bold this year. And I'm actually just curious. Does it, it looks from people who have spoken, would this board be interested in enter? And what I mean by that is I'm trying to determine where Boulder is going to land on this. I think that we're probably going to have, I had to guess, a 6-3 uh, majority of council that might support this. Um, but you know, who knows? I mean, in other words, six of our three members might be willing to like relinquish local control for the sake of having uh, greater um, affordable housing transit and and uh, greenhouse gas uh, productions. Would this would this board uh, generally kind of share the same sentiments and that at the very least be open to entertaining that? Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense where people are at. Not not that you're you're going to be asked for. <laughs> to give us that authority so much as I'm, you, you are folks who are in the know about whether policies like this make sense. And so I'd be just curious whether you, you all think, and you don't, maybe if you could just raise your hand, you know, so you don't have to speak up. If you, if you think you'd, you'd be, okay. That's we talk point. about the limitations of what transit can do when transportation and land use are involved. And Ryan loves talking about walkable, compact development and how that'll help us achieve a lot of our goals. And so, yeah, I think there would be okay. an appetite for that amongst this board. And, and we could speak to how a, at a local level we see opportunities with that and, and some of the limitations that have hamstrung us over the years. Okay, all right. That's We've all. also spoken for a number of years about um, a section of the city's charter that prevents TAB from inserting itself in any land use decisions. I recognize we're not a quasi-judicial authority like the um, planning board, but uh, it appears that section of the charter has sort of been interpreted to sort of exclude TAB from most involvement in land use and planning development decisions. That might um, be with more specific instances that are like mm -hmm. in site review at a more conceptual level. Right. I don't know as much of that. Yeah, but we have, but as, as, as a board, TAB through various iterations of its membership has tried to um, sort of adjust or, or weaken that um, sort of strict delineation between planning board, planning board and land use decision making versus tab input on, on yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So another way of saying that is we're, we're, some of us are pretty hungry to put in a letter to council on uh, getting aggressive right. about, about land use legislation that we, we okay. could ask. All right. All right. See why we wouldn't be able in principle to write right. a letter if prompted us. I mean, yeah, and, and I'm certainly not asking you to do that because I'm just curious where you're at. But yeah, so as this as as bills get floated, and if your if your board does decide to make a recommendation to council on it, I think that could be appropriate. Awesome. Yeah, I never know what council's going to do, so we'd be happy to help weigh in on that. Yeah. Well, you know where to find us. Okay. Come see us again. Thanks for your time, guys. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Thanks, Carl, and good luck at the Thanks, legislative Carl. breakfast in the morning. Right. And Natalie, did you say that's the, the one matter from the staff? Tonight? Yeah, that's all we have tonight. Thanks. Awesome. We'll move on to matters from the board. First, with the World Day of Remembrance update from Trini and possibly another one about Fairview. Yeah, so I'll start with the World Day of Remembrance, and I want to thank everybody from the city and the, you know, transportation and mobility department and everybody that braved the cold because it was absolutely freezing. So thank you, to, uh, thank you, Becky. Everybody that was there, it meant a lot. Um, it was considering the circumstances. I, I have learned a lot, and next year the event will be held during the daytime. A hundred percent. I think the day got colder and colder and colder as, as it went on and it would have been a lot better attended and more successful if it was during the daytime. So next year it'll be, um, we, we did have most of city council present. We had some, I think everybody spoke and it was overall a great event. The mayor spoke we had some press there and I considered it a great success, but, you know, more importantly, we were part of this great effort as nationwide and we had 63 events. Our goal was to get 50. Last year we had 35. So the growth is, is really 
significant. And like I was telling, um, oh, he's gone. Well, like I was talking about before, each event was paired with an ask for each community. And that's that's very, very important because, for example, our, our ask is to support the speed enforcement cameras, right? But that each community has a very different ask. And I think together it makes the event continue to give throughout the year and it changes the perspective of you know just not only remembering but also acting on behalf of people that were tragically lost to this horrible crisis and so as a result of that as well we had the opportunity to meet with secretary Pete Buttigieg and we got to present for specific asks moving forward. And it's just been, you know, it, it it has opened a lot of doors and it has really shown at least me at a personal level, how, how there's such a drive to really create change in our country. And it's very exciting. Um, There's so many <laughs> different mm -hmm. sources of um, funding that were not available before this year. And that's also very, very exciting. Um, I'd like to show you guys a picture. Can I share my screen or not? Do you guys want to see the picture of us at the event? And I don't know, I, it's kind of a mess here, but so there we are. <laughs> so thank you, everybody that came. Um, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> and oh, yeah, and thank you, Nicole. You're very nice for saying that. Um, and yeah, and so that was a great success. And thank you so much again to everybody that had something to do with it to make it a success. DK, who doesn't like to be thanked often, but I really do want to thank him because he he made a lot of things happen. And I'm sorry to be such a pest, DK, for such a long time. But but yeah, so thank you. And And yeah, and... Now I have to move on to something that's not as nice. Um, I noticed that Landon's gone, but um, so my son attends Fairview High School. And in the last two weeks, there have been two crashes outside of the school. And one of them was a hit and run involving an, an e-bike and a 14 year old. Um, there's not really been a lot of follow up as far as what's happened to the driver. I know that the police did get a hold of who he or she was and they were in conversations with this person, but there was really nothing further. And then that second incident was outside of the school. Again, it was with a vehicle, but I really don't know any more details beyond that. Um, I know Tila Landon said he talked to you earlier today. I spoke to him too. And I think there's a plan. I think that moving forward, there are a lot of things that can be done, at least in respect to um, e-bikes and and an effort to kind of, I, I know that you don't like to use this word, Tila, but educate the community on, on the different challenges that e-bikes bring, right? As far as speed and as far as what the expectations are of driving behavior, especially in multi-use paths and so forth. But I mean, I only mentioned that because the 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 child or the the teen was on an e-bike when he got hit. And I mean, it's unfortunate. But yeah, one of the things I wanted to suggest, and I mean, I don't, I don't even know if this is my place to say this, or if I'm just talking as a community member, but there's a lot of speeding going on on Galipsky, um, leading toward Greenbrier, and maybe just adding a van or something that would deter people from, from speeding would be like kind of a band-aid solution for now, until something more can be done. But I don't know. Um, do you want to talk about it, Tila? Because I know you talked to Landon as well. Sure. Thanks, Trini. Yeah. Um. You know, this came up at the last tab meeting, and after some outreach from community members, uh, and I think Ryan had made a very good point last time. Um, that while we definitely don't want to. We don't want to discourage the use of bicycles 
<laughs> and e-bikes, particularly class one and two e-bikes that are sort of blessed for use in the city um, have the potential to be a real gateway for kids who otherwise would be relying on single occupancy vehicles or carpooling or whatever. Uh, and so I was pretty clear with Landon uh, in particular that the messaging that's come out from BBSD so far has been sort of, here are tips to stay safe on your bicycle, uh, on your e-bike, uh, you know, stay visible and <laughs> know, know where you are. And a lot of blaming, blaming the vulnerable user or putting the onus of the vulnerable user in a place where the law and logic does not um, place the onus of responsibility. Uh, and that it's a fine line. So what I was trying to do with talking to Landon was focus on um, the Super 73s. And I'm honestly, I'm forgetting the name. DK and I have talked about it a little bit uh, of the other. Um, it's basically an electric motorbike. It is not an e-bike. Uh, it's not even a you know class three bike. Um, and so to draw a really strict delineation between the ones that um, are helpful up to 20 miles an hour versus the ones that can be as design written, you know, in excess of 30, 35, 40, 45 miles an hour. Uh, and that's what the Super 73s are. Uh, I did see a photo of the e-bike uh, in the first collision that you described, Trini. Um, in your description just now, what struck me was you said uh, it involved a student on an e-bike. And in fact, it involved another student driving an SUV. And I think that your omission of that is pretty indicative of just sort of how we talk about and how we think about and the messaging around these things. It's it's automatic, it's not your fault, it's something that's ingrained. I didn't but know. You didn't mention it. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was I a saw driver. It on TV, <laughs> but I didn't know student? that it was um that it was a student. I didn't know who it was. It was a student on a bike and a student driving a car. Okay. And you you were just like it involved a student on a bike. Was, was yeah, 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 because you I didn't go back know. and listen to the to the video. No, I meant I mentioned that it was a driver. I just didn't know who the driver was. Um, Later on, yeah, but your initial description just said there was an incident at Fairview and it involved a student on an e-bike. Um, yeah. And uh, and and the initial description sounded like the student on the e-bike came out between two parked vehicles, and so maybe not where a driver was expecting to see them, and possibly at a higher speed than you would expect a pedestrian to come from. But nevertheless, the legal onus is on a person who is driving a motor vehicle and not the electric motorbike, I think. I, it's a kind of a weird class of, of, of vehicles. But that's kind of where, that's the sort of the fine line I'm trying to march with, with BBSD and messaging. And Landon, I think, is understanding that a message from the BBSD health department um, where they had sent out a message to, to the community um, about safe e-bike riding practices was missing the mark in a couple of respects. And uh, we're gonna think about it and, and he's willing to work with me on, on messaging and noting that BBSD of course uh, encompasses a number of municipalities and cities and not just city of Boulder. And that we have to make sure that the messaging is appropriate across all of those cities. Um, we're planning to convene in January with more decision makers across different city agencies, um, including Boulder, but not exclusive to Boulder about how to talk to um, administrators of the schools um, to better message to the parents that there are preferred and non-preferred and advantageous and not advantageous e-bikes or motorized things on two wheels to give your students. So it's probably not going to happen in time for like the gift giving, um, you know, holiday rush. But at the moment, um, the Super 73s are priced, you know, $2,500, $3,500. And so we're really talking about a small portion of um, the BBSD families that are likely going to purchase such a thing in the next couple of months. And so our, our goal at the moment is to start convening uh, in January and hopefully have a solidified, acceptable, positive message about e-biking and cautionary message about these um, motorbikes by the end of the school year. That's where we're at. I just want to clarify, by no means was I victim blaming. I mean, I no, was no, I know. <laughs> the information I had, which was, it was a driver. I had no idea it was another student. And, um, and I knew that it was, a, it was a young person that was yep. on the e-bike. So yep. just making that clear, please.
Um, I also suggested, I know that Bicycle Colorado is working with CDOT on creating materials that will help, you know, just bring awareness to, you know, safe practices. Right. And as I said, like a DK and I just happened, we ran into each other at REI a couple of weeks ago and he said the city staff is working with um, the city attorney's office to like just come up with some kind of policy statement. And so, you know, yeah. we'll hear more of like Boulder, city of Boulder specific messaging soon, but um, there are a lot of people thinking about this from a lot of different corners and it feels like, you know, sort of similar to when the e-scooters came online and we were trying to figure out what, what was safe and what was not safe and where, where to sort of draw the lines about um, what was okay and not. We're kind of in a similar situation right now, but it does feel more urgent because these are not just vulnerable road users, but predominantly, you know, children, people under 18 and yeah, they deserve attention. So Thanks yeah. for that. But I'm, I'm working with Landon on it. We'll loop you in for sure as I know more. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for bringing this up, Trini. I remember when I was at Fairview, a pretty horrifying crash where someone biking down Greenbrier got doored by a student getting out of their car. And it's always been in front of mind for me there. How dangerous that hill is for, for people on bikes. And Tila, thanks for what you're doing. And I encourage you to move forward and with an emphasis that you're working in a personal capacity, not representing the city, but you're certainly entitled to do that and support you doing that. Thanks. Any other matters from TAB? Seeing none, it looks like under future agenda topics, we've got a couple of big things coming up in January. Uh, briefing on citywide and department racial equity work. Natalie, is that a bit of training for us where we're learning how to better use the racial equity tool? Yeah, that's a good question, Alex. So we need to um, settle on when TAB would like to do their racial equity training. Um, kind of the city is working on every board and commission doing an annual racial equity training. And um, we have some options of when we can institute that, whether that would be during a board meeting or during maybe the special um, hold that we have on the off Monday of the month um, or you know some other time. So we kind of wanted to get your feedback on whether or not, um, basically if you had a preference so that we could start working on getting that scheduled in 2023 um, as far as timing for that training. My thought would be we shouldn't do it during a busy meeting if we're already gonna have a lot going on. Um, so, and perhaps we don't know that yet To So maybe it would make sense for all TAB members to put a hold on our calendars for the fourth Monday in, in January. January. And then mm -hmm. if, if we have some flexibility with our regularly scheduled meeting, we can take advantage of that, but otherwise have that as a backup. Anyone yeah, and I'll say uh, it was unclear whether or not they were gonna, going to be ready to go in January. They oh. might still be kind of taking feedback from all the boards. Um, so it may be like sometime in the first quarter, it might need, we might need that fourth Monday. Um, but I, you know, we'll certainly stay in touch. And as I learn more, I'll just be in communication with you, Alex. Okay. Yeah, we can discuss that at our agenda mm -hmm. setting meeting. And then as far as the future agenda topic item, um, we are planning sometime in first quarter to also just bring an item forward from staff on the work that we're doing as a department um, with regards to racial equity and then you know broadly for the organization. Awesome. It looks like tentatively for January, we also have a Dr. Car Dr. Cog board update from council member Spear. And then as always, if members of TAB have anything that they would like to see on the agenda, feel free to reach out to me and I can work with Natalie to, to get that on upcoming meetings. Ryan? Alex, I thought I had nothing, but now I'm remembering, did we, did we talk at the agenda meeting about um, a, a, a annual letter and if we wanted to raise that, or I, I can't remember what we said. Um, was, were we supposed to talk about that at this point? <laughs> I guess we had asked if there was an expectation that TAP from council for boards and commissions, including TAP to provide a letter and 
Natalie, the latest you heard was that there wasn't an expectation. I see Meredith shaking her head. Right. I believe this year there isn't a letter um, being requested from boards and commissions. Um, the nature of council's retreat in uh, January. I'm not sure if it's in January or February, but the nature of the retreat for council this year is really to check in on um, their priorities that they set this year in 2022, early 2022. And so there, um, I don't think there's really that need for kind of like, you know, it often is new ideas from boards and commissions. And I think council is trying to stay focused on the priorities that they've set. And so I believe there isn't that request coming for a letter from the boards and commissions. You're reminding me, Teal, if I could just real quick, just, just to complete the thought, um, you've reminded me, we exactly had this conversation and that's when I said, and we don't need anybody's uh, invitation to write a letter. <laughs> so, um, and then I think somebody said, well, okay, fine, Ryan, you can share that with Tab and see what folks want to do. So, I mean, my, my opinion on this is that um, if we have a, if we have a, a year in review, it's some thoughts on what's working, what's not, that, that could be a nice letter. If we have um, a message at all we want to share, um, that's what, you know, that's what we're here for. So um, I don't know. I think, I think a, a annual recap or a look ahead for the year can be quite powerful. And that's it's our job really to give strategic advice in, in my, my mind. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we have to, but I think we should consider the, being leaders on this and uh, seeing if we want to agree to tell council something. So I'll, I'll stand down. Well, that reminds me, I mean, did the letter um, that you crafted appraising staff on their nimbleness and, and quick action on CAN, that, that got finalized and sent, did it? Yeah, that was, yeah, and that was like a few board meetings ago. And, no, and that, it was, it was, uh, I have to look. Sorry, not board meetings, I mean council meetings, a few council meetings Yeah, ago. yeah, 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 probably yeah, yeah, a few sorry. council meetings ago, but. Um, they've heard from us recently, and I think a little bit of like rah rah, <laughs> we're in the right direction is maybe a, a good place to leave it if they're not seeking um, input from from the boards to say we are like can is the way to go. <laughs> Keep on it for these seven reasons. I I I really I really liked how that letter turned out. So thank you so much for that work on that. I could leave things as they are. And if we were to reach out, I think it would be, so I think we've sort of looked at the year behind us and talked about mm -hmm. what's coming up and it would be supportive of other things in the work plan. If it's like a e-bike rebate program, DCS updates, um, things like that. I think we could provide staff with, or council with our perspective of what um, staff is doing. And that wouldn't be you know trying to throw out a new idea. Yeah. Um, but also think like we're we're in a good spot, so I'm fine either way. Okay. I, I realize there's one thing I forgot to mention and just wanted to plug it. Uh, Community Cycles does its annual holiday kids bike giveaway. Um, they're stretching it over two weekends this year. So there was one last weekend and there's one that's coming on the 17th. I forget if that's Saturday or Sunday, but um, people do have to register ahead of time, which is something a little new. Used to be you just kind of showed up to a like big cafeteria and <laughs> handed you a bike, but I think they're trying to um, allocate staff resources a little bit better. But for if you know people in the community, it's for kids uh, under 12, I think ages four to 12 or something like that. Um, and they can register and get a free bike um, this coming December 17th. Awesome. Any other matters slash future agenda topics? All right, well, thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. And I'll wish everyone a safe holidays and happy new year after I get a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Tila, I'll second that. All those in favor? Unanimous with five. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and yeah, I'll see you all next year. Enjoy your holidays. Thanks. Bye-bye.